हेलो हाँ जी असलाकुम रिशन भाई अपने ही बंदे तीन है क्यों और भी कोई आ रहा है हेलो ओके माय डियर लेट्स गो ओवर विद व्हाट वी हैव फॉर यस्टरडे हाउ हाउ हैज बीन योर एक्सपीरियंस माय डियर वेलकम बैक या दैट्स ओके द एक्सपीरियंस वाज गुड यस्टरडे हां हां and uh, uh yeah i won't be attending to this class just like so i am in transit uh -huh. that's okay so that's okay it's okay no problem and, uh like uh, uh, we having offline classes also now in the college or that's just going to yes, be on we can, we, we have we are getting back to school and then we can do online as well but unfortunately just because yesterday uh I planned uh, for a lab. Actually, I had planned for a lab, but um, I I think some things were not uh, comfortable for everybody. That's why the instructor was he gave the class not in lab, but he did it in on Zoom. Uh, from before I had uh, yesterday's uh, uh, class. I couldn't do so. I thought he would do a lab, but hasn't happened like that way. It's okay. We'll do it in school. Not this week. Uh, I think next week we'll do all school labs. So okay. just keep yourself prepared for that one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. No problems. If ever you would be able to, um, by the time no. If uh, if you're coming back, I know you're coming back, so you can take a day okay. off. No, no worries. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. And for yesterday, what did we learn? Let's let's see for uh, yesterday, what did we learn first, so that I can go over with things in that particular way. So you guys did chapter eighteen and nineteen. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Talking about chapter eighteen, what did you learn in chapter eighteen and nineteen? Let's see. First, Nima will say, then Pema will say. One by one, you guys will tell me what you guys learn. So that I have an idea of what's going on. What did you learn in uh, what did you learn yesterday? Um, we learned about different type of like like when the person has dementia, like it tells you how they act. Mm -hmm. We learned about that. We learned about how to like wash people's hair. Mm -hmm. Um, before like shaving their beard, you have to ask for permission, and you have mm -hmm. to like you know ask the client or the supervisor before that. Mm -hmm. Um, we learned about. Mm, what else did we learn about? Oh, we learned about what was it called? P something where you have to like put a mask on and a coat and everything. PPE. Yes, PPE. Yeah. Well, you have to cover your whole self. And then we learned about that's all I remember for you now. Okay. So you did, did you go over with chapter this? Let me see. Yeah, we learned about the chain of um infection. Yes. Questions, hostilic approach. Okay. So what I would do is let's go over with this chapter eighteen, I would see. So you did go through this and I would share this slide with you guys. Uh, hair care you did. Um, Russian common. I think this should be. Preventing infections, which is very, very important.
did you go over with what kind of infections you can see? Yes. So let's let let's get to know some common infections. Uh, what you would be able to see in the hospital or in your workplace. What are those? Hmm. What type of infections we learned about? Yes. Um, non pathogen something. Mm. Mm. Let me go through this chapter today uh, quickly and then we will. How is that? Okay. Let me go through with, with this chapter. I'm not pretty sure where we are at. So this is your job. Oh, learn about fungus too. Okay, let's let's go, let's go over with uh, this chapter, and uh, from there we'll go, we'll we'll keep on moving ahead. So when we say when we say um, preventing infections, covering your uh, previous chapter as well, grooming, bathing. Always remember when you enter into anybody's room, first and foremost thing that you do is sanitize your hands, put the gloves on, regular and a normal gown. If you see you're going to just help your clients with some things, which can be pretty simple, that's fine. Wear the gloves only with sanitizing your hand. But if ever you see, you would be walking outside, you might see your patient, your client is standing, but is wobbly. You're always at a risk. So you can put a gown on, redirect him or her. Can you have a seat, please? I'm just coming in. I'll help you. Try to put a gown quickly on. We never know what we are touching. It can be soiled, cannot. It can't and cannot be soiled. But without gloves, do not get in. As soon as you get in with the gloves, take the gloves off. Sanitize your hands again. Every time you touch anything, sanitize your hands. After you sanitize your hands, you come out of the patient's or your client's room or your resident's room, you can wash your hands. After three sanitizing, this is mandatory to wash your hands. Talking about grooming, bathing, quickly, quickly, brushing, always I have told you when you shave someone, you will have to ask. It's normally they tell you, it's can you shave me? But if you have a resident, you have a client, you're applying patch, you have to remove not only his facial hair, but also the body hair, we always have to ask permission. Now, coming back to this infections, we should always remember, no matter what we are working with, we are working with a vulnerable people. Vulnerable people means people who are old, People who can be immunocompromised. Even you yourself can be immunocompromised. You might have some uh, things going on which can lead you to uh, less immunity. If ever somebody has an infection, you might get it. So the best thing to prevent infections is we should wash hands properly. We should wear the gloves. We should put a mask on. Coming back to infections, the biggest infection again in the winter is flu. COVID is back. We have I've been going to hospital and every other uh, patient in hospital has, is COVID positive. It's hitting people very badly again. Not at the same time intensity like people used to because we are now uh, having vaccines all cleared off it is 
I think it's now like a flu flu, but it still is there. So please, if you're going to work, if people don't have any flu, it's better to wear a mask than to get sick. This is one of the common things we suffer during an infection. We suffer flu. Second, after flu, we have C. diff. Trust me, C. diff, UTI, pneumonia, these are three sets which you would see. If you're a patient, if you're a client, if you're a resident, you go in, you see the who is liquidy. How would you recognize what I am dealing with? You see the poo is liquidy. The poo has a smell. Very strong smell. Very strong smell. Right away, right away, report it. Don't take it. And that that means he or she, and if she is not on antibiotics. Oh, you can always ask your nurse, hey, hi, I just want to uh, ask you, is she on any antibiotics? Because she had a watery BM. Uh, plus it was strong smell. You can send it for C. Dip. It's called C. Dip. It's a bacteria that is present in the poop. This C. Dip, if you see anybody, you have to put a precaution sign outside. And that person will have quite a idea for a couple of days. So it's better. It can happen in two people. One who are on antibiotics or because antibiotics also cause C. diff. It causes our normal flora to be the bacteria that are in our gut. They come out. That causes this diarrhea and causes C. diff. One reason and the other reason is just because of the bacteria C. diff. If you see those, wash your hands very thoroughly, very, very thoroughly. If you touch your phone, your keys, something, wash those just to break the chain. The second thing is your uh, clients can have UTI very common because elderly, they don't drink water much. They don't remember. They keep on touching things. They don't, wipe, they don't get wiped. They are soiled. Most of the time, they don't know. They don't drink. So they are soiled. They do, they do are at a risk of infections, especially UTIs. If you see this patient, this client, this resident has UTI, make sure you wash your hands again properly very much. You apply gloves, take it off. Before you touch anything, again, sanitize, come out, wash your hands. Then do your regular thing. And please make sure if you are dealing with C. diff, if you are dealing with uh, pneumonia, if you're dealing with UTI, use proper gown. The, uh, your gloves, your mask, your... And may, you have to make sure that the gown is here and the gloves is over it. It should be properly fit just because it is your safety. Once Try to take your gloves, uh, goggles. We don't put too, mu too many goggles. We have a mask with a sheet. So that mask should be the last thing coming on after sanitizing your hand. First, gloves you will take out. You will take out your gown. You will sanitize. Then you will take off your face shield. And again, you will sanitize. And when you go out of the room, you will wash Because these infections do not carry them home. No person is allowed to take this home just because of not washing your hands properly or not sanitizing your hands. Okay. Saying infection is serious safety. Yes, it is infection control. I have told you guys again before and I will say that it's a, it's a chain. It starts from, it can start from the food that we eat 
that comes out of cold water. If you touch any poo poo, if you're doing, because we, even our own selves, if you go to the washroom, we clean our bum and we don't wash our hands properly, something is left over in our hand. We touch something, the bacteria sat there. We, after that, some other person will come, he will touch it, he will get the infection. He didn't realize he put it in the stomach just because I'm just holding, I did this, it was on my hand, it went in. So this chain of infection, it keeps on. So just please make sure washing hands properly is the best way to break it. Why? These bacteria, they always, always have, when it's not favorable condition, they create a wall outside them. Why we say we you need to learn food safe? The reason we say you need to learn food safe is how to handle food properly. If you do not boil your milk, just warm it up. I'm just going to give you an example. Or you left your food on a, uh, on your counter table for a while. Now you realize, oh, it's been, uh, I'll just put it in. For those four hours, two hours, one hour, the bacteria has already grown up. Now because you saw, oh, there's no smell, but it's okay. I'll just quickly put it in the fridge. Put that thing in the fridge. We froze it. These bacteria, they see now the condition is not favorable. They create a wall against themselves. When we only heat it up, only warm it up on a mild temperature to eat, it became favorable for them. They break it and we eat it. We are at a risk of infection. But now, how we can break it down? One thing, we need to, there's a specific temperature, more than 365, that we use to break their shit. Not all the time it can be. On our hands, how can we do that? We do touch things. We got these bacteria. We applied sanitizer. At times, these sanitizers, when we apply, it does not wash the bacteria. They created a shell against themselves. Now, the best way is, Washing hands. When you wash hands and you wash your hands with warm water, then you apply cold water in it. You, this cold temperature is not good for them. They try and create a cyst against themselves. Once they create a wall, you apply soap and wash it out with cold water. They get washed out. They don't get killed. They get completely wiped off from your hands. So first, warm water, scrub, scrub, and then you wash with your wash your hands under cold water. Cold water will uh, let them off your hands. That's why washing is very important because washing, when you wash, they have already created that wall for their safety and it washes them off. Other things do not wash, do not kill all bacteria, not everything. When we go to the school, I'll show you, remind me, we have, we have that globe thing. We can uh, wash our hands and you wash, one person will wash hands properly with soap and water. One will do it with warm water, one will do it with cold water. Then once you wash, dry your hands, we apply that powder you will see wherever you have bacteria, it will become blue. If we flash that light on it, it will show, it will glow up. So that is the reason washing your hands is very, very important. Encourage your, encourage your residents, encourage your clients, encourage your patients to wash hands as well. Just because if only you wash your hands is not going to prevent infection. Your clients, they touch every single thing. Do you get me? So make sure you wash their hands. You encourage them to use sanitizers. 
if they suppose they do they did their hair oh i'll do my hair myself okay they did their hair once they keep the thing down okay now uh can you use this hand sanitizer please some of them are installed on the table on the table if not grab a sanitizer put that on their hand and they will do like this they do mostly the old people they don't apply on top tell them to oh can you watch me doing it and then we'll do it together yes and then they are out encourage them to wash their hands every time they do who these things they touch things if you are touching uh, their things might as well take a wipe wipe it the table they sat on do not before they sit on it just wipe after they go just wipe that area because they can leave bacteria down back there if you if you have them to the washroom some might come out without washing no 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 my dear let's wash our hands first if they are using their walker and they're one person or they're independent they move of their own with their walkers make sure you when you touch their walker you have a gloves on and you wipe it so that you don't get it a micro uh, organism sometimes is also called as germ a bug living is a small living plant or animal seen by micro this is they're also called pathogens. This is what we know, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. So your clients can be at a risk of fungal infection. Most of them do have fungal infections. Now, very common sites, their nail beds, especially their foot. You know these between our digits, foot and hand digits? that one you might see fungal infection near the hair it's kind of dryness anything under the nails whiteness look that one parasites i told you very common c diff you will see this very commonly in people when it comes to viruses and bacteria pneumonia is very very common disease that is caused by them. Uh, normal flora i told you they live in our gut if ever uh, we eat something we get a food poisoning first our gut bacteria they do not live in the gut they come out that causes infection that causes food poisoning quickly super bugs we have to treat them with uh specific medications now coming here when we talk about superbugs these mdros and, and mros some people they are the carriers they do not show symptoms but they do have that infection and because it's just i would say the parasite does not harm them because he, the parasite lives in that person. The harm is the person is carrying it everywhere, but he or she does not have any symptoms. That's why when you're, you will come across this, when your client is new to your facility, we do a swab. That's called an MDRO and MRSF swab. Uh, I don't know whether if you have seen uh, somebody who gets too many boils, uh, they do ask, can you do an MRSA swab? MRSA swab is you get a swab, you put one swab in both of the nostrils and groin. You write, this is nostril swab. One swab used for both nostrils and you put nostrils on it. You get the other one the groin area site because these are the two areas where this bacteria called staph aureus staph aureus bacteria lives this is the bacteria that causes this mrsa 
And then if this person is MRSC positive, we always put a contact sign on. Because most of them are no speakers like this, we want to make sure they don't have this bacteria, they don't carry this bacteria. So please make sure you check for the client has MRSA or M MR, MDRO, both of these. MDRO, it can be from mouth sweat, MRSA, groin, it's skin, it's groin, and these nails. And this bacteria that is present, you should remember, it's called Staph aureus bacteria, Staph A. As I said, MRSA, we are in, it's very, very calm, uncalm. We are, we are, I haven't seen in Canada. Your C. diff, the C. diff is Clostridium uh, deficit. This is the one that you see anybody more than one to two BM a day, lose, strong smelling, should be sent for C. diff. Anyone who is on antibiotics will have C. diff. So these infections are, they are very, very strong. The chain, breaking the chain of MRSA and C. diff is very difficult unless you don't take proper precautions. You don't put proper PPE. You don't wash your hands properly. It's very, very difficult. And it might, it spreads faster like a fire. So please make sure you keep an eye on when you see your clients, not all the time uh, they have dark yellow. If you see somebody's pee is dark yellow, is um, amber color, like tea color, does not mean he or she has UTI. The smell also tells you the order, the color also. But sometimes they are on medications. If they took, uh, let's say, vitamin ta tablets last night, it can be in the morning, the pee should be dark. So encourage fluids all the time for your clients. It's very, very important, whoever you're dealing with, unless the client is not on restriction, it does not have any heart issues, does not have, um, what is it called, restrictions for water and salt, that's called cardiac diet. If it's not a cardiac diet, encourage to drink water. Yourself, try to drink water. The more you drink, the more you flush. Um, you would see people with local infections. And the common infection would be for a local infection, cellulitis. Skin, red uh, skin, swollen. It has blisters, sometimes watery. Cellulitis is very common. Uh, yesterday when I had a, uh, I had a couple of patients, one of my patients had neck cellulitis. I had to give him antibiotics. Some, they do even get amputated because of cellulitis. Just because they are diabetic, you have to amputate their legs. The infection is so bad, it can be stopped. We try to give them antibiotics, IVs. So it's not just wine IV. It keeps on running 24 hours. But if they don't, if it doesn't work, again, they go for amputation. Uh, if ever it is. Because this, this specific local infection can spread through blood into every organ causing a state, a very, very dangerous state called sepsis. Where, God forbid, people die. If you don't take care of them properly, if you see somebody is very cold, his in, uh, temperature is very low or very high, person is at a risk of sepsis. Very low, in fact, very low temperature or very high temperature. Both are a sign of sepsis. 
you don't only see that if you see someone who has very high temperature you will you, i mean uh, depends on what scope they give you you will have to take the blood pressure your nurse should take the blood pressure you will have to notify the person the sepsis is a state where you it's if not taken care of properly a patient passes out and that the brain gets affected the brain can work. so that's why you have to make sure that this local infection most common examples we have cellulitis um sometimes we have gangrenes uh gangrenes is dead any dead organ you would see some people have a uh, black toe complete ne necrosis it's just because they have diabetes they did not take care of it the blood circulation was not there it became uh, green, purple, blue, and completely black because it is dead now. Necrosis means dead tissue. Gangrene is a dead tissue. That's one of another local infection you would see. Systemic infection, it can be respiratory, it can be eye infections. Again, Pink eye is something that you should very take care of. If you see some people who have uh, whose eye uh, eyes are watery and the uh, eyes are red, please make sure the discharge is can be dangerous. Do not touch the client without gloves. Make sure when you're dealing with your client, you deal with them using the gloves. And the other thing is, you should isolate them. Why we should isolate? If this person who has infection, let's say he or she herself, he or she herself is aware I have infection, but and she is gonna touch things with sanitizer. But it could be they are old, they are dementiated, things are left. You should put a sign outside. Somebody getting in should be careful with whatever they are touching. Whatever they are touching, they should be careful with it. Because if there's a wanderer, make sure you close the door. There's a wanderer. He gets in, touches his things, goes in another patient's room, our client's room, took it from room one to room two, now went to the nursing station, put his hands there, nursing station is dirty. The other person came in, she kept her, you or your client, uh, co-worker came in to write something, got it on the hand. You went on the table, dining table, you took it to the dining table, so it keeps on spreading. Make sure you put a sign outside with whatever infection. Is it a contact precaution? Is it an airborne precaution? Is it... Uh, what is it called? Droplet precaution. Droplet means when they have flu, COVID. So make sure you put those infections. Contact plus plus. Contact plus plus means for people who are C. diff. Everything for them, for anybody getting in should be covered. Isolate the patient. Do not put him with all other patients. So that this infection from one person would not spread everywhere. Um, this one we talk quickly. Yeah. If somebody is throwing up, make sure you give them a bag. Don't allow them to touch everything. If ever the person touches something, wipe it off. Because we ourselves can be the ones touching it. Isolation is very, very important. If somebody is on, uh, let's say, has UTI, has a foley, also has a foley, do not put his foley on the ground. Put it on his bed on a blanket because we can always put that thing for washing. But if you put it on the ground, it might stay there. The infection might stay there. 
we know about this influenza, my God. If you're working, it's better to get the flu shot. Otherwise, you might not be able to work. The policy can be not to work. It will help. Uh, portal of entry. Pathogen is that microbe, organism, say bacteria, virus, fungi, causing infection. Reservoir can be water. Reservoir can be our human body. Portal of exit, rectum, poopoo, where we do poopoo or bum. Mode of transmission, uh, we can say just because this is present in, I'll give you a good example. If you see, we always say, where are you from? Are you from any, uh, if you go to the hospital, they ask you. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they ask you these questions. They give you India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, these couple of developed, undeveloped countries. Why? People do not have proper sanitizing. Have you traveled to these countries recently in the past? Three, four, why? Because they know the sanit sanitary system is not uh, all the time protected in all areas. There's a washroom, people poo. It is connected to a it goes somewhere, right? The tank it goes is very close by the water. Water has to see through these pores in uh, inside the ground. If that water reservoir and this sanitary, uh, sanitary tank are closed, they are at a risk to get contaminated because if this water from this tank seeps out, from here it also absorbs it because when you... Dig in a well, is there a water in it? No, then we see where what level the water will come in. That's how it happens. It's talking about reservoir. It can be lake, pond, anything. Somebody pooped near the bank, washed, or not only pooped, washed their hands, were sick, carried some bacteria, the whole pond became, our whole water became, water body became uh, dirty, contaminated. This now mode of infection, it ran through something, it goes through that uh, by, uh, pipes came to us. We drank it water, bottle of entry, our mouth. Or sometimes what happens, You there's a bacteria, it's in me, I throw up, bottle of exit, because I'm throwing up, I'm getting vomited. This mode of infection, Somebody came in, I had touched it on side rail. This side rail, you came in, you touched the side rail, you didn't realize, you took it. You went, you touched your phone, you put it here. You wiped it, but did not wipe it properly. You took home somebody from kids, family member touched it. See how you keep on spreading it. You did not wash your hands properly. You only wiped. You did not touch your phone. It's just the keys, your purse. You carried it. You left your purse at home or in the workplace on the table. You apply, put it on the table. So this is how this chain of infection keeps on growing. Just because if you sanitize your hands till you come out and after you coming out, you wash your hands, we'll stop it there. If you encourage your clients to wash their hands and to sanitize, it will stop there. If you wipe whatever you touch or whatever your client touched, it will stop there. If you are at risk, you have uh, low immunity, put a mask on, put a gloves on. And always when you wear a PPE, do not use from one room to another room because that PPE also is infected. Always when you come out of that client's room, you need to doff it out, walk, again sanitize and put the new one in when you get into another client. 
We don't say this has the same thing and this has the same thing. No, this bug can be stronger than that bug. We don't carry this infection to that place. So always after every one person you come out, you take off everything, you put a new one out. Vaccinations are very, very important. The sepsis, it's just that we do we use septic technique or do we use aseptic technique? Aseptic is where there's no bacteria. Uh, contaminates, not com wearing gloves, cleaning, disinfection, sterilization. Sterilization is the best method, but we can sterilize all things. PPE, okay. Standard precautions, let me see quickly with this. I told you about airborne. Airborne is a, when you have, COVID is not airborne, COVID is droplet. Pneumonia is droplet. Again, contact, C. diff is contact. Put a sign outside. Very, very important. Suppose you change or you help your client and you remove. Please make sure if your client, if your resident is on any of the precautions and you put the linens in the garbage, uh, linens in the linen bag, do not mix his or her items with the regular linens. Make sure you put that client's linens, clothes, clothes means linens, his garbage separately and bag it every time you, because again, this can be at a risk. I don't know this, these linens are from this client, room number one who has seen it. I just checked and I dropped my, other clients' uh, stuff in um, this basket and accidentally I touched this. So please make sure his linens or her linens, the garbage from the person who has infection is also separate. The, the Let's say a blood pressure machine that has been used for this client. When you get in, you do a blood pressure or your nurse does a blood pressure, should be used only for this client. Should not be used, it should be left inside. If there's a magazine, it should be left inside. Do not take it out, no. If you are short of things, then every time if you take it out, you have to wipe it off, not with regular uh, wipes. You have to, have to sanitize it properly, each and everything. Then you can take it to another one which is not possible uh, to wipe it all that. So just the machine, the book, the utensils you use should be taken off last. He's taking a, a food. This food should be, uh, once he's done, you don't stack it into uh, everybody's. You put it on a separate, uh, this stacker, and then you take it separately. Because the, otherwise, when he ate, the saliva has bacteria, the spoon and everything. When you touch it with every, the other person who's washing dishes in the kitchen, the dishwasher, he doesn't. He just washes them regularly. No. So these bacteria stay there. When you know this person is having an infection, this, this thing's going on, it has been done separately. They do clean it uh, even much more with precautions and they do not put it with the regular ones so that this chain of infection gets broken down quickly. I have already told you, we do do TB tests before you start to work. We use N95s and N95 is not used for droplet. An N95 mask is used for airborne precautions. Also, it's very, very important to use N95 for 
without n without putting an n95 mask your airborne precaution is not covered so whenever you see someone with airborne precaution you have to put an n95 for droplet again you have to use n95 you might not but airborne you don't have to take any chance mm. Shop containers, make sure, again, those are isolated for these people. Every time you would see each room should have a shop container. That yellow boxes. Do not ever, ever let your clients touch it. Um, if you see the people who are, there are nurses, there are workers, unfortunately, who who dig into these sharp containers. If you see, I don't know whether you have heard about these stories or not. We had so many uh, incidents at hospitals and residential homes where the nurses, where the support workers, get it, they know that the client is on medication and sleep, sleeping pills. They are on methadone. They are on hydromorph and some of it gets wasted. They dig into it because they are addicted. So when you see someone, cap the syringe properly, very tight, and put it in so that they are at a risk. And do not ever, if you see, actually, you see your nurse has an injection. She is doing, she did the injection. Some people, they do, this is a cap, and they hold it in the hand. Never, ever. Never. This is the cap and I have this syringe. You will do it like this. Sometimes you might miss it. Because you have already given a shot to your client. Think about it. You gave a shot to your client. And now you are trying to cap this. Like this. You might not put it in the cap. Something happened. You got a push from someone. Or you got distracted. You poke yourself. So this hepatitis C which that client can have, you got it in yourself. Always, there's a button there in your, at the bottom, pull that groove, it will close. If not, if that is not possible, this is your table, this is your injection, you, you can put the cap on the, and then you can scoop. Do not, this is not a safe practice. 100 times you might have to go in, get the swab, do these things. Do not. This is not safe practice. No. Always on the surface and scoop or use the grooves. If you're dealing with something, let's say there was a dressing change or you, your nurse, your um, team, when you are doing a teamwork, you were doing a procedure, you see there sometimes splashes. It can come on the face, it can come on your body. Somebody is throwing up, you might get splashes. So that's why I cover your face all the time with that shield mask. There's a mask that is up to here and then there's a shield. Try to wear those all the time. Anything that comes uh, from the patient's which is a fully bag, a colostomy, the blood product bags. If somebody got blood, they do not go in regular garbage. They go in biohazard, yellow bags. Someone who is having, again, chemos or had a chemotherapy, had a radiation, goes in cytotoxic, blue bags. This is biohazard. Um, safe transportation. Again, this is so. This is your infection control that you read yesterday. Just a quick rundown on this because this is very very important. M making sure we are there where we want to be. Okay. Was it that you guys did something more than this yesterday? Or are we missing something?
Um, we did reviews. He we did true and false on like the textbook. Okay. Like, answer questions, and he was reading it to us. We were just telling him if it's true or false. Uh huh. And yeah, we did true and false for both chapters. That's good. Yeah, and we just reviewed the chapters. That is really, really, really good. Always remember signs on clients' doors. Garbage separate. Linens separate. Food trays separately. Making sure the sharp containers should be closed. You yourself should always have a face shield on. Properly donning and doffing. Putting on the, um, what is it called, gown, gloves, goggles, face shield. If someone is airborne, you also have to uh, put a cover on your shoes. Because when you step into the room, your shoes also get dirty. So wipe your shoes when you go home. Or you might keep your workplace shoes in a bag with a label of your own name at, at your workplace, if possible, in your locker. Am I clear? Do not carry those bugs home. So our next today is our safety chapter. Mm -hmm. Which is here. Let's go over with safety. Safety is very important when it comes to you, when it comes to us, when it comes to our client. Are you able to see my screen now? Share screen. Let's do it. Okay. Safety starts with whatever we say. We need, if we are safe, we can keep our clients safe. If our clients are safe, Yes, it's vice versa. Safety is the basic, basic thing that you have to keep in mind. If ever you're not um, keeping all the measures in your, like you don't follow the policies properly, one, you are at a risk. Second, you are at a loss. Things go wrong, they will go against you. If you did something and you try to help your, your client, your resident, but is um, he or she had safety issues, you might get into trouble. One, you might lose a job. Second, you might not get covered by a third. Third, you might even have to pay. Your client can sue you. Or if you your workplace does not have proper safety policies you are following your policies properly it can be you suing them it can be you asking for compensation if you get sick this is another thing and we don't want things to go worse so we always want to make sure that everyone is working in a safe environment Safety is the basic need and right. That's true. A client and residents are at a greater risk of accidents and falls. Everyone that you have is at a risk of fall and accidents. They are very frail, they're very weak, they're old, they have dementia. If ever they have a fall, they will mostly they hit their head or they hit their uh hip joint and we cannot repair it because they're old old the repair thing is very very difficult think of you being a child being an adult being older adult and being aged healing is not same for everyone a child can get healed in a day 
an adult can older adult can get in two days older three days maybe older older adult in a week but with these who are elderly it takes months and years and sometimes not they pass out with these injuries so please please make sure your clients are safe your clients are not at a risk of fall. If somebody is at a risk of fall, again, put a sign of falls risk. Common sense and simple safety measures should be prevented. Yes, declusterization. Putting, having uh, proper lights on. Not walking them off with their mobility aids. Non-skid shoes and socks on. Make sure the floor is not wet. Make sure the bed is not too high. It's in the safest and lowest position. Those are some safety and common sense things that we do. We do not put all side rails up because they are in a deep sleep. They just came out, wanted to be their independent, but did not realize that you put all the four side rails up. When they step over, it becomes high, their body length is not too much, they fall. Promoting having every time your uh, clients should have a call bell near them and it should be working. Before you leave, uh, make sure it is attached to the wall and it works. Having a call bell in hand but not attached to the wall where it works is not safe. Just because he or she is pressing the call bell all the time, sometimes we remove it. That's the truth. And we forgot to put it on. Promoting client safety is one of the priorities of support workers. This should be, this is one of the things that you do and has to, has to be there. Someone who is on oxygen, make sure the wires are not tangled. The tube is not tangled. You must protect clients, residents, visitors, yourself and your co-workers. Everyone should be safe. Have to make sure that you do measures that will protect each and every person. If you don't put a say, sign out, your clients are at a risk of infection. Again, it's safety. You put too much tight jewelry on. You see, it's the jewelry is on the client, and it's so tight now because your client is normally it's not tight, but something happened. The patient is getting swollen, has um, has swollen feet. The socks, the shoes. Today, this is safety. If blood will not flow. Don't you think it's safety issue? So clothes, if the clothes are too tight, can they not create trouble? Yes, they can. So please make sure that we always, always think about safety, how we can promote safety. In a safe environment, clients face little risk of accidents or injuries. Again, safety is some do not leave medications. You were changing the client. Your nurse came in. I'm giving you a scenario. Oh, these are her meds or his meds. I'm keeping them on the table. Can you give him? You cleaned. You did not remember. You left the medication there. It's not safe. The other person can come in as dementia took God because this medication was not meant for that. You give an injection. If you do not dispose it properly in the normally it's at the back of the bed. If you do not dispose it, you can get poked. Your clients can get poked or other co-workers can get poked.
again safety some clients they do uh, get patches you know when i have you seen those patches uh, when you they're very transparent when you remove the flap like a bandit when you remove the flap those flaps are hard the plastic ones but they're so transparent you removed it you applied the patch on the client and you did not dispose this plastic flap again please remind me in school to show you that thing it dropped on the ground it is a plastic slippery transparent thing when you step or your client steps on it it's like a banana peel you fall the simple thing is i peel these two covers did not put it properly in the garbage can i forgot it on the table it somehow slipped on the ground my client me and my co-workers are at risk safety think about safety we change an iv those ivs have a cover from the front that are some knobs they are on the, we, we sometimes are in hurry oh yeah, yeah yeah i'm just coming 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 and we walk like that we did not look down we tripped over safety too many things at one place this is his tray, uh, tray table this is the bed this is another chair so many things at one place you might hit yourself or your client might hit because when you're transferring them you you might hit you your client safety so please make sure that when you're working the environment should be safe when you go in you check the bed is working or not properly you will tell your client oh you can raise your head head uh, in your bed and he or she is cognitive. So true. But if you haven't checked that day, the day you enter, you haven't checked whether it's working. These are machines. They can break down anytime. Morning time, you always do a safe reach. Making sure the window blind is closed. The door is closed. Uh, there is no, there are no wires on the ground. The table, uh, is a little bit away from the client or one table is near the bed. The other things are far away that the client may not trip on it. There is enough light in the room. Those are some of you. If your client is on oxygen, make sure the oxygen is on. It doesn't matter he has a nasal prong. The tubing is on. The tubing is attached to the wall, but it's not on. When you get in, you remove the nasal prongs in the morning, you have a gloves on and you touch it like this. It will, you will hear that because there's pressure coming in, right? It should make that, yes, this is working properly. You put it back, you put it at the back of their ear, make sure it's secured with some tape or something or either on their ears or on their clothes with a pin so that it doesn't move. If your client, if your resident is at a risk of removing these things, make sure soft, re soft restraints or mittens are on. That is safety. Facilities and community care agencies are responsible to create and maintain a safe environment. Yes, you have to make. If your uh, client, again, Climbs out, he's, he or she is a climber. You should have a bed uh, alarm. Without a bed alarm, it because that bed alarm, once they move, beep, 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 we come to know and we have to run. Otherwise, if I am on, my uh, nursing station is here and on the very far corner, there's a patient. How will I come to know? Is he moving? Is he trying to come out of the bed? What's going on? How will I think about everybody's safety? It's not possible. You can keep, you only have two eyes, two hand, arms. 
but critical thinking. Oh, this patient keeps on moving. Why don't we put a bed alarm and a chair alarm? If the patient is in bed, bed alarm. If the patient now moves into the chair, make sure you put the chair alarm on. Once they start to, oh, it will start beeping. Beep, 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 beep. We come to know. Everyone, whosoever is nearby would rush and make him hard, hard to sit, redirect him to sit back. That's how you think of safety for these clients. Someone is a wanderer, you put a wanderer guard. Once they come close to the door, it starts beeping. And you make sure you look at it that uh, the door is closed, the main door. Your floor, you might not, because when you work, you don't, you're not responsible for the whole facility, you're not responsible for the whole hospital. Only a side, per, uh, one floor or on one side, because we are humans. We have to think about our safety. We have, if someone is having an aggressive uh, behavior, there should be a purple dot, dot, a purple page outside their uh, room. Purple means aggressive behavior. Everything, every. Patients' medication chart, patients' medicines, everything you will see a purple dot. If you are going in, do not right away go in, knock the door. Look into where the patient is. Just because he's independent, not independent, but uh, independent in the sense can come out of the bed. Is is now on the uh, at the back of the door. Just waiting, the nurse will come. I will punch her. When you knock, you try to step in. You don't see someone around. Be careful. Safety. Employees must provide training to staff to update knowledge about lifts. If you are using lifts again, before you put the client on uh, on a lift and you're using a lift, first check, is it working properly? This is WIMS you have to do. Again, this is Learning Hub. Without this, you can go on. I told, uh, I think the day you were uh, better, Pema, when you were not here, I told them you guys have to do Learning Hub. Learning Hub for BIMS, Learning Hub for Safety, a Fire, Fire Safety, you have to do that. And spills. If there's a spill, what do you do? If it's a chemical spill, if it's a client peed on the floor, is it a regular uh, way of cleaning? It's not you, are, you guys are cleaning, it's housekeeping cleaning, but what's your job? What what you are can you leave it like that till the housekeeping will come? No, it. What do we do? Grab towel, put it on, just throw it on it, so that it gets soaked. Use common sense. There's a fire. You would see a lot of time. You are your clients. Our co-workers, you, you're working with each other. In the kitchen, there's a fire. In your, not a big, big, massive fire, but still. You were warming up your food. The microwave caught fire in the lunchroom. What do you do? That is all we have this WIMS and safety, fire safety. It's on Learning Hub. You will have to create a Learning Hub. Um, account before you go for your final practicum, you should have access to your learning. It's your responsibility to know and practice basic safety measures. Do not keep your hair too long open. You, you have hair, long hair, beautiful hair. It doesn't mean you have to cut it, but tie it so that if you are working with your clients, they might not pull it. 
if you go with long hair open and you're changing, they might not pull, but it will touch when you're providing care. So it's always good to tie your hair before you go and help your client. Again, safety issue. If you have long nails, can you be able to clean them up? There can be a leftover infection. You got from for yourself infection. If not treated, is again a safety concern. If not properly handled, is a safety control. Awareness challenges. Again, um, if you are working with your clients, if you see you got a spill, sometimes uh, they are just you you or your co-worker or your clients, they were doing something, something happened, you see it went into the eye. A splash. Make sure there's the eye washer Always there's a liquid near the washing station. Go and check where is the nearest, if ever there's a spill, if there ever there's a splash. Before you work in a facility, for, for your own safety and for the safety of your clients, make sure you orient yourself to where I am going, what I am looking for. If something happens in an emergency, Towards which side I have to run. You are new to it. I'm new to the facility. Which side is the main door? What if the, there's a fire? You don't know yourself which side is the exit. How will you help your clients? Be very familiar with which way is the exit. Know your place in and out. Is also a safety reason. Concern. Safety does not mean one thing. Safety means working on all platforms. Knowing the numbers to get in and get out. Locking everything down is safety. Awareness and challenges someone who is unconscious confused or disoriented is able to recognize, react or to respond to dangers. Yes, if someone is an unconscious one, is a confused one or is disoriented and somehow there is a fire, earthquake, they will give you those drills. Who is my first person I should help? How should I connect with my clients that time? Things should be ready for you and for your clients. Being preoccupied, tired, under the influence of alcohol, you took uh, a night med you were not able to sleep for two nights yourself. You took a medication, and the sleeping pill has some effect. And you are like, oh, I'm so sleepy. Can you help? Can you see things properly? No. I told you yesterday I came back from the night shift. I had 16 hour. I didn't want to come and teach you because last time when I did, I myself felt very, very upset with the thing that I was falling off apart while I was teaching you guys. I didn't really know how I delivered. When I don't know, what can I deliver? Why should I create an environment of unsafety. Check yourself with safety issues. Think how I am creating a safe environment for my own self, for my co-workers, for my clients. If you are feeding someone, do not, and he is a feeder, do not feed him or her hot food. Because they don't, they can, they're non-verbal, they can speak. You just gave them. It's so hot. They burn their tongue. Do you think it's safety? Yes. You are feeding them tea. They're confused. Oh, it's hot. You can drink it later. Let's leave it for a while. Redirect. 
that's safety. Do, do not leave the cutleries that they eat with open. After they are done, remove it. Again, if your clients, they cannot see, they are visually impaired or they have hearing impairment, put the uh, glasses on first, put the hearing aids on first before you help them. If I can see without my glasses properly and you are helping me to the washroom, how will I be able to look at the way? I can't. It will be hard for me to move, for you to mobilize me. I might have a fall. You might have, you might break your back. Because I can see properly, I am becoming difficult. My transfer from bed to the washroom or from bed to the commode is getting uh, difficult. One, I am at a risk of fall. Second, you are at a risk of injury. Safety. Taste, smell and touch challenges. It's CWMS. If you see someone who has very dry skin, who has frail skin, and they are on blood thinners already. If they bang themselves with these tables, chairs, bed, they're easy to bruise. They're easy to get harm. You have a cut. You got it from a paper or you were helping yourself at home. You got a cut. Now you are touching the patient or you're dealing with things. Safety. Gloves. If you don't put on gloves, you can put yourself at a risk. Mobility challenges over and over. Every day I'm telling you. If the person is heavy, it says on the care plan, one person. This care plan, check the date when this care plan was made. Yes, I do agree. The client when I had her, when I was moving him or her, was one person assist. But he or she is no longer. My client today is not doing well. She's sick. Can it not be possible if I slept in a wrong position? Oh, I have a very bad neck pain and I have very bad, bad back ache. Will I be able to move? the same way that I used to do yesterday? No. Not really. Might not be. So is it safe to move that client off your own? No. You can always ask for help. Call your nurse. Call your co-worker. Hey, can I just get a hand here? She's not doing very well. I think she's not able to move. What's the big deal? It's only using your brain. Your client still is very good, is very calm, is cooperative. But she got sleeping pill. She got pain medication last night. She's drowsy. Is it safe to move? No. Why not to give a bed pad? Why not to give a urinal? Why not assist them? If he if he's drowsy and he's like this, can he put the urinal, use the urinal? No. Your client is sleepy and it's breakfast time or lunch time. Is it safe to give him food? No. Don't feed. Hold the tray. You put the food in the mouth. Okay, I open my mouth. I'm sleepy. I go back to sleep. My mouth. The food is in the mouth. Are you not at a risk of choking? Safety. Before you feed, make sure. Hello, Mr. Smith. Can you open up your eyes? Here's medication for you. Here's some water for you. Bring some water, please. Make sure they 
are alert. At least they open their eyes. They are aware of what you are trying to do. You would give inhalers or puffers to the client and make sure there is nothing in their mouth. If I have something I was eating and you gave me a puffer, while I breathe, I have to look, try to breathe, try to keep it like this and do. See, you have to move your airways and if there is something in your mouth, again, you are at a risk of choking. When you did a safety check, make sure there's a suction back there. Something happened. Normally, I don't choke. Ouch, sorry. Normally, I don't choke on things. I was eating and I choked. Would you wait for uh, the suction thing? Somebody will, or you would go in somebody's room, grab it from there. Can I, is it possible all the time? I, I can survive till that time. I might not die. Because of choking. Think. When you go, you say, I did a safety check, making sure that there's a suction, it's working. Okay? This is very important. Uh, age, both young and old people are at a risk. Very, very young and elderly. Both are at a greater risk than your normal people. What can be another risk factor or another safety issue you think? I'm an elderly. I'm in my chair. I'm in my bed. What can be a safety thing? What can be a risk? I'm so calm, I'm so cooperative, and I am with it, but I am in my bed all the time, or I am in my chair all the time. What can be a risk? Huh? Any idea? Uh, falling from the bed or from the chair. But I'm saying I'm cognitive. I do not come out of the bed the way you sat me. I will sit in that same position. I will not move. I am at, at a risk. Um, the person may be depressed. Huh? They may be depressed. Wait, wait, wait. Amrit, you have put it on a mute. I want to hear what she's saying. What, my dear? Um, you said that the person you put in the same spot and they didn't move. Yes. I'll be thinking about um something that's been worrying them, or they may be depressed, or something's bothering them. No. Think about it. I will repeat myself. I want you to use critical thinking. Yeah. I'm a, I'm your client. You guys changed me. I'm now sitting, and you put me on a chair. I'm very cooperative. I don't move. I'm, I can move off my own. I'm sitting. You put me in the chair for at nine o'clock. It's mm -hmm. been ten. It's been eleven. It's been twelve. I'm in the chair, or I'm in the bed in the same position. What am I at a risk of? Um. Oh, your bones can can um they can like I don't know what's it's called but uh, bed sores very weak bed sores skin breakdown. You sit in one position, your skin. These are bones, bony prominences. I keep my elbow in one position. Look at this. This is a bone. There's some meat over a bone. But if I'm old, I'm elderly. Do I have fat? No. Very thin skin. And now this is on this uh, with the bed for three hours, four hours. It starts to break down. Bed sores. 
what anybody sitting elderly especially for us also if you sit in two hours in one position and i can't move don't i when i teach i move myself don't you guys move yourself don't you get uncomfortable why because our bones create a pressure on our skin now if there is no fat it starts to break down that prior dry dehydrated skin your skin is at a risk of breakdown that's why first and foremost thing for you to know your job is reposition anybody after 2 hours 2 hours is the maximum time you can put someone in one position any human being sitting in a position more than 2 hours how healthy it is the skin starts to break down skin breakdown i i agree there are people who are at a very high risk because i told you i'm not able to move air does not go in those areas when there's no enough air there's no enough oxygen reaching there's no air entry there think have you seen sometimes you wear clothes and uh, or you wear a watch let's put this take an example of a watch and you put it on it's not too tight but it's the right size you don't remove it what happens there's some vacuum like your skin starts to get moist again that can be a risk of infection bacteria love moist dry, dark areas somebody who is incontinent wet moist peed is in a brief did we check him every two hours we should check them if not in two hours they peed and they're in that pad it's moist pad is closed is it dark yes another thing is it too cold no it's warm temperature in the room bacteria grow in dark moist and room temperature bacteria start to grow the applied is at a risk of skin infection another uti did you get me you and your once the skin breakdown starts they do not eat properly they don't have a proper intake it's hard for them for us to cure them and it's hard for them also to fight against these bacteria so remember toileting every 2 hours and repositioning every 2 hours this is a mandatory job in your list it doesn't mean you go and take them to the washroom no ask them or you check if they can tell you whether they are wet or not reposition you have to go and reposition the anybody 2 hours if that client another thing other than skin breakdown that person is lying in one position blood does not flow it does not flow properly to all organs once it's not going through uh, the whole body properly our systems will not work again risk okay older people older persons experience age related changes having an increased risk of fall and other accidents weaker muscles they have weak muscles slower movement and reaction time you ask someone 
to turn. Give them a moment to first process it in the brain. I need to turn. Okay, they they ask themselves, turn either on right or on left. So it takes them time to process it in brain. Then, because they are weak, their muscles are not so strong, it takes time for them to move their arms, move their legs. The movement is slow. If they don't have proper strength, they will not be able to stand off on their legs or off on the um, mobility aid, whatever they are using, a two-wheel walker, a four-wheel walker, a Sarah Steady, whatever lift. They will not be able to hold on properly on that. Children are at an increased risk for being accidentally hurt because they touch everything. They jump from things. They use sharp. Do not put sharp things. Do not put uh, sharp edged things in uh, their reach. Do not leave medications. Those med medications, they are so attractive. Some medications are so attractively colored. They think it's a je jelly, this, uh, what is it called? Uh, gummy. It was not a gummy. It was a medication. They took it. They think they are, these are gems. Smarties. They are so nice colored. So do not keep medications in reach of kids, children, or even elderly. They are confused. They... They don't tend to eat somebody's medication, but because they're confused, they don't remember I took the medication already. They again take it. The fact is, you know, if it's a blood pressure medication, it will drop. If it's a sugar medication, diabetic, the sugars will drop. Everything has a side effect. Supervision may not be as careful as usual if the caregiver is distracted or tired. Yes, healthcare workers are at a risk of injury if they are distracted or overtired. If you are overtired or you are distracted, your mind is somewhere, your body is somewhere, you are thinking something, looking at something. Sorry. Again, in my mind, I need to go and do this thing. But I am looking at my client here. Oh. They say, tomorrow I have to do a swap. I'm thinking in at one time over three things. I'm distracted. If I am, my client needs some help, I might not pay attention to it. Sleep deprivation, it includes decreased judgment. If you are sleepy, you might not be able to make the exact judgment that you need to do, poor decision-making and memory skills, you might not remember, slower reaction time, you might react slowly, lack of concentration, you might not be able to concentrate properly, and you might not be in a good mood. You might be grumpy. It's not only, think about this, it's not only one you, it can be your client, it can be the uh, team you are dealing with. In the team, we also include their family. Sometimes their families are more grumpy than anybody that we are dealing with. The aggression comes from them. Ways to reduce fatigue. Uh, remember, workplace policy in Canada says you cannot more work more than 40 hours a week. If you work more 40 hours a week, you get into fatigue policy. If things happen to you, you are responsible for your own self. Nothing can cover you. It's not only work CBC, nothing, nothing can cover you. You might not be getting the proper uh, protocol of health just because you worked over your fatigue time. That's why if they are looking at your schedule, they always ask you, is there anywhere you are working? If you are a student, they'll ask you. 
being as a student is also you are coming to school, you are working, it is taken off from, it's been included in your fatigue policy. Poor nutrition, stress control, regular exercise. These are the three things that you can reduce fatigue with. If you eat properly, you might get enough nutrients and you might not be fatigued. Sometimes you are fatigued not because of this, but because you are anemic. You don't eat properly. You have uh, thyroid problems. Why not to cure it? It's not all the time you cure things with medications. You can make proper judgments and you can help yourself with proper nutrition. You did not take proper your breakfast you always miss your breakfast how how much energy would you like to have in the morning without your breakfast would you be energetic no if you do an exercise every day would your bones be soft would your muscles work yes properly while if you have to squat today 10 times what would be the scenario in the evening? Would you not get tired? If you are a runner, you do do enough exercise. You run for 15 minutes every day. While you are at work and you keep running here and there, you might not feel the same level of fatigue. Choosing employment that best meets your lifestyle and personal demands. Make sure when you're working, think of which environment I'm working in, whether I want to work in a busy area, whether I want to work with heavy clients, whether I want, it is up to you to meet your needs and lifestyle. I'm a couch potato. I will go to, a, um, I think, a residential care where I am not dealing with, I'm just uh, not dealing with all these things or I will go to a client's house I have two clients I'll go what I have to do I just have to feed and watch them just because I am at a risk of backache all the time I might not work where uh, I have to walk distances where I have to go <laughs> lift heavy people why don't I work with client to client I can pick my client I can if I get a client who's heavy, I might say, refuse. I, sorry, I, I might not be able to do this client. My back doesn't allow me. Can I get someone else? I might not work five days in a row or five days, like five days in a week. I might work casually one day. I might not even work someday. The next week, I'm working three days. These two weeks, I'll not work. I might work part-time, two days on, two days off. Two, day, two nights on, three off. Think of what suits you. Some employers offer short shifts and work rotation schedules that reduce the negative effect of fatigue. Yes. Sometimes they will tell you, oh, you know what? We only need help for four hours. Can you be here for four hours? Can you do uh, today uh, sitting? We need a sitter today just for watching someone for eight hours. Not mandatory, you will be doing 12 hour shift. So, this is all what you with identifying your client. Identifying your client is the best. Example of safety. Amber and Amber. Amrit and Amrit. Nima and Pema. How close are they? When I am talking, if I am talking fast, Nima and Pema can go together. It's a name alert. Amber and Amber. Amber A, Amber L. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, I swear you will. John, Smith, David, Cheng, Chin. Every other patient you have, wherever you work, you will get that. 
Singh. We have a very big community here, uh, Sadar community. All of them mostly have Singh as a last name. And when you say Mr. Smith, Mr. Singh, who are you addressing to? I have two Singhs. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't remember the first name. Then what did you come here for? Oh, I'm looking for Mr. Singh Amrit Pal Singh. Think of it. Identification. When you work in a facility, another thing that you and your facility should do, if it's not, you should always really ask for it. There's always a picture on the door. Small uh, picture, photo ID on outside the door. This is 402 uh, Async. And there's a picture. This person has been now in this residential home from 2008. This picture was taken in 2008. Let's say 2010 they changed. We are in 2016, for instance. This was changed, but since 2016, it has not been changed. Now we are in 2023. Will the person look same? Do you look same what you were two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? No. And then when this picture was when she arrived or he arrived in the facility, that time taken, will they look, they don't, that time she was not wearing glasses. Now she's wearing glasses. How the hell will it look same? So make sure when you're identifying your client, outside if there's a picture, ask them for an updated picture. On your uh, iPads, when you will have your iPads and you will have to go into a client, if it's not an updated picture, forget about being on the door. But the iPad that you are working on, if there's no uh, online updated picture, how will I recognize my patient? I'm just new. I have just started. They don't look same. I haven't seen her before. How will I identify my client? Look at their wristbands. If, they, if these wristbands are faded, do not. For heaven's sake, ask for a new one. Double check with your other co-worker. Oh, is this uh, Mr. Singh? Is this Mr. Chen? On their fly, fly, files, if there are two Ching close by, two Singh or two Chen, which is very common, Smith, Johnson, Johnson, John, John, put a name alert sticker. On all their belongings, medication, file, clothes. I might take, she told me, take it to Mr. Um, Singh. Take it to Mr. Chan. Oh, she told me, Chan, I just saw Chan. I got it. But there's another Ch Chan uh, at the end of the hallway. And this medication was for the hallway guy. I gave it to the first room. Because... As I am new, so familiar yourself with your client. Know your client. Try to identify your client. Who my client is. How does he look like? Right person. So before performing any care, make sure you are giving the right care to the right person. That's why we have to do a double check, three checks. We always say three checks and three rights. Right person, right care, right medication or whatever you're doing. With. Another thing, when it comes to identifying your clients, when it comes to safety, Always double check with the date expiry. Date and expiry is very, very mandatory. I have this medication 
it has a name of my client. I can recognize my client. Very good. I did. But suppose I am the one who is working in home support and I'm giving medications. Think of it. I took the medication. I did not check the time or I did not check the date. I just went in. Oh, my next medication is here. I popped up, popped it out from the, what is it called? The bag. This, the blister pack. Now, this medication that I took from the blister pack is no longer to be given. Because I did not check the right date. I did not check the right time. And I did not check the right expiry. I did not reach that side of the blister pack. And I gave yesterday's medication which was been missed or which was been held because I was not able to swallow. I was not doing well. I was sleeping. Did I make a boo-boo? Yes. So think of these things as safety concern. I gave my client food. My client was not supposed to eat. He or she went for a test. They gave anesthesia topically. She can swallow, she cannot feel the muscle. The food is in the mouth. The medication is in the mouth. Is that a safety concern? Yes. My client, identify your client. You can be working in, why I'm talking about medication, you might be working in um, home, home support. You will not be doing uh, bedding changes. You will not be doing uh, only cleaning bum. You can be the ones doing medications. Before you uh, uh, kind of get me out of the bed, are you reposition? Are you transfer from bed to chair, from chair to bed, or vice versa? I am a person who has asthma. I am a person who has COPD. If I don't realize that my care plan says before you move the plan, give puffers. You did not give me puffer. Now you turn me, ask me to turn. I did. I'm just coughing like hell. Because I can't breathe. What would you do? Are you at ho home? Yes. Do you have access to oxygen? No. When I'm short of breath now, how far will you run? Where would you get the oxygen from? Is it safety? Did you... Is your client at risk of any injuries? Yes. So please make sure you do the right care, right time. Use your decision. Always right person, right date, right time. Identify those things. In home care setting, identifying the client is fairly easy because it's just one client. Because there's usually one client per home. Make sure you have the right assignment sheet. Do not pull. I'm again telling you. You're looking at the care plan of Smith. But it's not Andrew Smith. You are in. It's A. Smith. But this one you are looking at is Andrew Smith. You thought Andrew Smith and A. Smith is same. No. Don't pay a guessing game. Always. Please make sure you check. You confirm. Ask, uh, hey, Mrs. Smith, can you tell me your first and last name? Can you tell me your date of birth? So you check what you have. When working in a hospital, confirm ID information on treatment card or assignment sheet with the client's ID bracelet. You always have an ID bracelet. You look at it. You hold it in your hand, ask them, would you like to tell me your name, please? Because in hospitals, they keep on changing every five minutes, every hour, every other day. 
So if you are working, nobody care. Nobody has the same patient. How do I identify my client? Do I rely only on my client? No. The bracelet that she's wearing is always, they always wear a hospital bracelet with their PHN number, with their RC number, the date of birth and their name. That is what is on that uh, bracelet. You I hold their hand and I say, can you tell me your date, name, first and last name? And can you tell me your date of birth? So you see with this one, you match it. Call the client by the name in the hospital. You call them by the name. When you check the ID bracelet, you don't go and say, hello, my dear. No. You can tell it afterward once you do the care, once you have done the identification. But at the time of identification, ask. Hey, Mrs. Smith, can you tell me your first and last name, please? Smith, Maria, Smith, Margaret. Know your employee uh, policy for identification of clients. I've already told and mentioned before, if you're working in a residential care or a facility home, most of the times it's on their clothes, at the back of their clothes. They have to, you have to turn the collars to check. They don't want to wear wristbands. They have steel, um, they have different, not the paper, um, these, what is it called, uh, bracelets. They have specific bracelets or the facility. Some are made out of steel, already named, carved on them. Different, different uh, kind of identification bracelets. Preventing fall and injuries. Falls are the most common cause of accidental injuries in all settings with children and older adults being at a greater risk. Always our clients, they get weak day by day. They're at a risk of fall day by day. They're hard of hearing, they can't hear, they have vision loss, they can see properly, they're at a risk of fall. They're older adults, their bones are weak, they are at a risk of breaking bones. Sometimes not only fall, but when they turn in the bed, they turn very faster, they don't realize, or they push themselves with the side rails, with the edge of the bed, they get hurt. Risk of fall increases with age and illness. There's a drop in blood pressure. He or she did not realize, got up, got dizzy, got a syncope attack, fell down, hit the head. Falls may result in death, serious injuries, or challenges in older person's quality of life. Patient had a fall, did not die, or something like that, but Needs surgery, hip fracture. Got a hip surgery done. But because even the hip joint is put back, it might not mobilize the same way before it was working, in, before the surgery. It's not all the time when they get fixed, when they are treated from the surgery, just because they had a fracture, just because they had, uh, we can say, there was a, clot, there was anything. They, remove, they needed to remove this uh, thing from them or they needed to get a surgery. Once they get into the surgery, it might or might not work the same way. Fall may lead to dependency on others. If they have a fall, yes, it will become difficult. Your clients may also fall just because they are diabetic and their sugar drop down. If you see someone who is dizzy, who is sweaty, who is pale yellow, it, it can be his hypoglycemic. He needs sugar. Falls are the leading cause of injuries in children. Accidental injuries are the leading cause of death among Canadian children. Uh, again, safety. We are, as parents, we are home. Or as a caregiver, we are at home. Taking care. Some Someone call you on your phone. You are talking over the phone. 
when you got inside their house when you are doing a babysitting you did not check you do not do a safety check to you it looks the window shade is closed yes it is closed but there is no uh, it's not locked while the kid is playing and you're talking over the phone he reached to that blind or to that window touched it 100 times in hospital it has happened we get patients like that the child was playing touched the blind the window was open boom fell down three stories five stories six stories on the ground when we are doing babysitting we are doing caring as a safety check go around and check all all the windows and doors are locked call bells call bells are unable call bells unable enables a client to call for assistance if your client is connected to a call bell has a call bell in hand but is not working it's not worth sometimes we do give them a call bell because they press so many times we pull it out from the way from the main source from the wall it doesn't but this call bell at the same time enables them if they are get, trying to get out they need help they need to help with toileting they need help with repositioning they can call they are not doing well they can call they are falling out they can call they are short of breath they can call call systems vary among facilities in facilities some call bells are connected to an intercom yes um to the phone and if we when they call we just put the intercom yes i need what do you need i'm just coming so through the intercom you tell them if it's a far far a little further up that side let's say the hallway is like this and it's closed and there we can see we can reach we always connect it to the intercom so that we can tell them redirect them and make things easy in new facilities call bells are connected to cordless phones nowadays we do have as a support worker you will have your uh, phone it will beep on it you can have your coworkers and your clients when they press the call bell you will get it and you can answer your phone you don't have to be on a nursing station because again there were issues i am not around the nurse, nursing station i am in bed 24 now how can i answer how can i answer my clients call bell how can i do an intercom so now the latest thing that we have done is we started on for our clients uh, uh, your calls come on the phone keep the clients confidentiality in mind while using the intercom on the cell phone make sure or on the cell phone make sure uh, you don't when you are dealing with somebody in another client's room the family is there do not give the whole detail oh i will come i'm just coming i'll help you don't say more than that because you are right now in somebody else's room we don't want call bells home care now call bells some clients are uh, unable to move out of bed and they need a way to call for help tap the bell is one it's just like a platform and it has one button just put your hand on it or it's like a tube and it has a red button in the front that can be uh, baby monitors can be used in home care setting clients can also use a small can with a few coins inside to shake to get to their intention we i have not seen anybody doing it till now children's toys with bells horns or whistles can also be used we don't use them but it just says book says something but practically 
we only put call bells that they are specific call bells that we use in facilities and in hospitals. Ensure the device is within the client's reach. What's the point of having a call bell when your client is in the bed and the call bell is on the chair? Please make sure when you get a client uh, in a, a bed or you change him or change her, you hand it over to them. They have it in hand. Preventing poisoning. Common sources of adult poisoning includes eating contaminated food. I have already told you, eating contaminated food is one of the reasons we get sick. Food poisoning. C. diff. Ding drinking contaminated water. Overdosing on medication. It does not mean always overdose on methadone drugs on street. No. I did not, I was not able to see properly what was written because my glasses were not on uh, and I am looking with my little blind eyes. The medication that I was supposed to take was Sopralol 2.5 milligrams, my regular uh, hypertension medication. But I, as I was not able to see, I brought an old one. This is also bisoprolol, but my old prescription was 5 milligrams. And the one home doing help for my own self. I don't need any home care. This is your client, me. I took it. I overdosed myself by 2.5. My blood pressure dropped. I fell on the ground. Causes carelessness, confusion. With me, this was my confusion. This was my carelessness. I did not put my glasses. I just tried to look with my little eyes. Difficulty reading medication labels, they are very, very small. Or I'm not that educated to, I can read it. I don't know what's written on it. If I'm disoriented, I don't know whether I took the medication or not. And who is giving me? Some are suicidal attempts. I've told you so many times. Preventing poisoning. Children have a natural instinct to explore their world. Often, young children put things in their mouth, beads in their nose, in their ear. All toxic materials in the home must be identified and locked away, including those small beads that they can put in their nose. There are some uh, bigger beads that they might cho choke on while swallowing because they don't know what it is. So we have to prevent making sure that wires, the sockets, the fingers are so small, they are crawlers, they are toddlers. They go in, they see we are putting a charger. Why not my finger? They're young. You're babysitting. Think of safety. Because we are not only dealing with adults, we are also dealing with uh, maybe as a, caregiver or a young toddler. Accidental poisoning most common between the age of one to four. One doesn't know what to do. Four is the one explored. So between one to four, they are at a risk. They take medication, they pick up anything, they put it in mouth, even garbage. They put, pick it up. It is very attractive for them. The foil paper, gold and silver. Oh, this is something. They put it in the mouth. They try to swallow it. What do you what to do if you suspect poisoning? Suspect poisoning if you find empty boy pill bottles or hazardous products lying around. If you see any pill container which is empty, and there were you should always double check. What happened? Why is it left there if if all medication was finished? Has somebody taken it? Client suddenly collapses, vomits, or has difficulty breathing. Difficulty breathing, the other name for difficulty breathing is SOB, shortness of breath. Vomiting, MSS. And colla they collapse them. Ensure the phone number for local poison control is posted. Near, 
you see your client now is exposed to some poison. If you never know where the number is, how to access it, how at the time of emergency would you be able to get it? Again, the, saf the safety is compromised. There's a risk, potential risk. Contact emergency ser medical services, which is EMS. The other name for EMS is what we call ambulance. But ambulances, they, we do have now small um, uh, ambulances that are also equipped. We call them EMS. They just come in. In the ambulance, you have all the time a nurse. But between these EMS, we always have the police and especially when it comes to somebody who's short of breath EMS comes the other name for EMS is EHS emergency health services not all the time it's called emergency medical services EHS or EMS gather evidence of poisoning they will see look around where I picked up the client and how was he lying how was she still lying what was around the area? And when they come in, they bring them to the hospital. They tell you, hey, I found this client giving the report to the nurses and doctors. Hey, I found this client lying on his back uh, on the floor in his bedroom. Uh, nothing was clustered, but there was some fluid on the ground, which looked like to me, they always go and get the, uh, we already got uh, the sample. It's here. If it's helpful for you. Let me put a label. The time when we took this client out of his home, this patient out of his home, this EHS people, they are um, authorized to do a blood pressure um, and they are uh, in, in their scope. They have oxygen. They can give suctioning. They can uh, put them on oxygen. Oh, I found them. He was very tacky and he was not able to breathe. So inside the EHS, we put him on one liter. Then he gave you a report. You write in the sheet and then the doctor comes and sees. Preventing accidents with equipment. Support workers are required to use household appliances, mechanical lifting devices, and wheelchairs and walkers. Please make sure these you know how to operate them they are charged they are not broken they are function you must ensure the equipment is safe and working order if you see if we uh, however you, you might know or you might not know we have glucose check machine that we check uh, glucose for every client you should do a proper check every 12 hours for that there's a way how you check it if the process gets passed it means yes this machine is good to be used for other clients however if this uh, machine was not being checked properly is it working or it fell down on the ground i picked it up i just rebooted it just a uh, fast and i never realized after falling on the ground there's always a difference. I see the client, oh, she is 4.8. Because this fell down, got broken. Somehow, this is that it doesn't work properly. It showed a difference. My client is all, already hypoglycemic. Okay. Fire safety. The entire health team must prevent fires and act quickly and responsibly during a fire. Three things are needed to, um, for a fire to occur. A spark or a flame, everybody knows, a material that will burn and oxygen. And this is freely available everywhere. So a fire can be caused anytime, anywhere. You should know, again, when it comes to fire, you should know, you should have, have done the fire an exit training on your um, learning hub. Who to move first, how to move the clients, when to move myself, what to do, what, where is my fire alarm button, which I need to press for emergency. 
Safety measures are needed where oxygen is used and stored. Agencies have no smoking policies and smoke-free areas where your clients, some of your patients or some of your clients or residents are smoking. They are smokers and need to smoke. So they're not allowed to smoke in the lavatories or in the bathrooms. You do have to make sure that they go in the smoke-free area. You accompany them if needed. Make sure they're steady when they move. Preventing fire, major causes of fire is unsafe cooking, cooking accidents, faulty electrical equipment, maybe wiring and heating equipment, fire and the use of oxygen. Oxygen is widely used in facilities and home care. Oxygen therapy supplies through portal tanks, wall outlets or oxygen concentrators. What happens is, just uh, to let you know, nowadays, in your facilities and uh, or in your hospitals, you have to have to make sure that there is a oxygen uh, check done at least once in a month in your facility. If it's a hospital, it's done every weekly because what happens is we do realize some of our patients stay in the place uh, was longer and medications were being given on time proper treatment was being taken, everything was done. But still, it took long for our uh, clients who were on oxygen to get better. The reason was, um, this has happened recently uh, in one of the hospitals. I don't want to name the hospital due to uh, confidentiality. The oxygen that was coming from these portable tanks, that wall outlet, was not working properly. When we put the client on uh, two liters, it was not being delivered as two two liters. At times, the flow of oxygen was faster and at times the flow of oxygen was uh, slow. If I have a patient who is a COPD patient or is an asthma patient, if I put him on two liters, I make sure that the he doesn't go beyond two liters, but my oxygen outlet wall was not providing proper two liters. It was going up and down, and I didn't realize in my client. At times, my client was so short of breath, and I was trying to give, trying on giving medications. I was trying to manipulate. The respiratory therapist came, oh, instead of two liters, can you put him on three liters now? We thought it is just because of the medical condition. No, it was the oxygen that we were getting was not proper. There was some. So it should be that every month in your facility, oxygen uh, therapy should be properly. The way from where this oxygen is coming is being checked. Why you ha you need to know if you are dealing with your client and you see there is a sudden decrease in the client uh, or the client is not getting better but everything is being done. There's no medically issue but something is wrong. So just use your critical think. Oxygen support uh, combustions. We always have those fire extinguishers outside and make sure you know how to use them. You have tried how to open. They're hard to, but during the drill, you can practice. When there is an actual fire, you can't. It has to be a drill, but actual fire drill, you will say, oh, how does this open? I don't know how to open it. What to do during a fire? Know where a fire alarm is so that you can press it and others will also get aware. You know your fire extinguishers and emergency exit. If you don't know, if you're not familiar where the emergency exits are, you'll be looking around. Would you be first finding out a way? Would you be helping your clients, your own self and your co-workers for exit? Remember race acronym. Race is for rescue. A is for alarm. C is uh, confined, E is extinguished. Always when there's an, a fire, 
we have to rescue our clients. We have to make sure the alarm is there. We have to make sure if the fire is on that side, somehow we close the door, we close everything on that side so that it doesn't affect the other side of the building and then extinguish or evacuate. Okay. Clear equipments away from blocking all normal and emergency exits. That's why even when you go in the plane, they will tell you, please make sure the emergency, ex you know your emergency exits and they'll ask you, can you keep the window open? Do not block the door. If there's something that goes, that happens, you can be moving things at that time. They do give you a quick overview. Oh, you're sitting on an emergency outlet. What if the fire comes in? If there's something in the plane, uh, just pull this thing, blah, blah, blah. The same thing with the our emergency exits. We should know where it is. We should know where our ex extinguishers is. We should know where our ambi bag is. If something goes wrong, somebody needs oxygen right away while running. We can't plug it in the wall. You give them the MB bag, they can at least start. Do not use elevators if there's a fire. This is common sense. You might, the fire may be uh, just because of the electricity, you might have to shut down. You will get struck in the elevator. Always use exits, stairs, all that thing. Types of fire extinguishers. Uh, three types of fires, A, B, C. A is ash, materials that burn and leave ash, like paper and wood. B is the burn or boil, materials that can burn or boil, that is oil and grease. C is the current, materials that have an electric current and can use electric uh, fires. So it depends when you see, when you hear about this fire drill, they will be able to and give you a code which tells you if what kind of fire it is and what kind of plan you should think while you're do, uh, doing this drill original drill using the wrong extinguisher on fire makes it worse so if you are using uh, for a extinguisher b it might it might worse it might create more flames Using fire extinguishers to use a fire extinguisher, rem remember always PASS. PASS, P stands for pull the safety pin of that thing, extinguisher. Aim low at the base, slowly. C, squish, there's a handle like, a, like this, a groove handle. So you squish on it. C, sweep from side to side. Agencies have fire extinguisher policies and procedures. Clients and res residents close to the fire are the ones who should be evacuated first. If you see a client or a resident who is closer to the fire, should be the one to be removed first. Your independent clients and one person assist should be the ones to be removed first. Because if you are moving a client who's a heavy client, you might not be able to do it off your own or you, he might take time. The rest would not be saved. So again, critical thinking should come first. Who needs to go first? Who needs to go far? The fire is on the right side and you are asking people from left side to work with. No. First, who are getting affected? Types of burns. Burns can severely and disfigure or disable a person. Yes, there are um, different kinds of burns that we see, and these burns you will you need to know and be familiar with them because every burn has different treatment. Caused by dry heat, which is fire, stove, and heaters, you will see the burn from them from the fire, stove or heaters is different. Moist heat, it is from hot liquids or steam. When water is boiling, hot tea spilled over the body, it's a different burn. Chemicals, if you, God forbid, get burned with uh, oven cleaner 
or with the drain cleaner. It's a different burn. Electricity, just because of faulty equipment, live wires are uh, lightning, it is different burn. Radiation is from sunlight. This is, uh, sunburn is different. Careless smoking, unattended cigarette bits, if you, you were small and you don't know, those burns are different. They will look, this um, smoking burn, it looks somehow uh, the after the burn, not the thing. After burn, it looks like a fire stove. But fire stove would be large ones, like it can be a patch. But the careless smoking one, it will be like a circle. Loose fitted sleeves or clothing when cooking, if it ca catches fire, the burn would be different. It's the clothing and the skin both get burned together. Okay. First aid for burns, minor burns immediately cool the injured area to reduce pain, swelling, blistering and tissue damage. Use cool water. If it's a minor burn, we always put cold water. Cover the burn with dry cloth, uh, clean cloth. Do not apply oil, butter, slave or ointment. Report burn to the supervisor. Seek medical attention if needed. Yes. Now, chemical burns. Brush off any loose chemical powder with a cloth because if it's still left there, the chemical will again cause skin breakdown and burning. Flush the area with large amount of cool water at least for 15 to 20 minutes in the shower just because it will wash every chemical down. Seek medical emergency assistance. Call for emergency. Call for EHS or EMM. Electric burns. You secure your own safety first. Do not touch the person because he might still get, he might still be electrified. If you touch him, you will also get electrician. So make sure, let him first calm down, then you touch. What you can do is always turn, try to turn off the current from wherever it's coming. And you don't do it direct. Always remember, you use an object, but also use brain. If you are using a rod and it's an electric current, would you use electric rod or would you use a wood rod? Wood. What would you use, Pemi? Wood, man. Why? Because it's much safer compared to electric. Because electric, because metals are good conductors of heat. And wood is a bad conductor. Of heat wood is a bad conductor. Yeah. Use wood. Use plastic. That means we use bad conductors we do not use good conductors rubber okay then uh, do not apply water it may increase the risk of shock again for heaven's sake if it's an electric burn do not use water water is a good conductor of electricity when we put a boiler in our water, water gets boiled because it's a good conductor of electricity. So if you have a burn and you put water on it, you will get more shock. Always think, burns, the treatment is different. Never use a good conductor. Think whether it's water, the material used should not be used because it can worsen the situation than helping out. First aid for burns, heat source burns, roll the person in a blanket, coat, sheet or travel to stop the burning process. Remove burned clothing that is not sticking to the skin. Cool the skin with cold water. Keep burn covered and may add, seek medical assistance. Why we don't want you to remove uh, completely the clothes? Because you might peel the skin off. Uh, protecting children from burn. Accidental burns are common in children. 
that can cause death or illness. Scalding injuries, that is from coffee, water tap, that's from hot liquids. Test temperatures of bath water. That's why the day we were doing that grooming and bathing thing, I told you guys, please make sure you test the temperature of the water. You might ask them to get in. It's so hot, it will burn them. When you're drinking, if you ever see, if you drink tea and it's very hot, you might burn your tongue and you get small burns, like slight burns. It causes pain. So if ever you are drinking tea, you spill that hot tea or coffee on your skin, it can cause always, it's called scalding injuries. Make sure you get um, cold packs and apply right away cold packs on it, ice packs. Preventing suffocation. Suffocation occurs when breathing stops due to lack of oxygen. If there's somewhere you got a burn, and if the burn is nearby the airway, you can cause it can cause suffocation. Not only that, how you can get a burn from how a burn can con cause suffocation. Do you have any idea how a burn can cause suffocation? Why they're saying what's the how a burn and a suffocation is related? Uh, maybe because of high temperature. What would happen in high temperature? Yes, that is. That's oh, very no. correct. What else? <laughs> you know, if the temperature is high, you're not able to breathe. Or okay. if there's a chemical, as any uh, chemical, let's say asbestos or any other chemical, and we breathe it, through our nose, our airway can burn from inside. Or it gets clogged up. Or it gets clogged up. Like you can breathe. I am allergic to dust. Think of it. I am completely allergic to dust. And when there's uh, something going on, uh, uh, let's say uh, a building is getting broken down, or I enter into an area which has only dust. I breathe in. Because I'm allergic, my allergic reaction is my throat gets swollen. Where, through, when I breathe through my nose, where else do I use? What else do I use? I use my this airway. And suddenly you will see. Some people, they're allergic to some medications and they their allergy reaction is their tongue gets swollen. When their tongue gets swollen, everything gets swollen here, our larynx, pharynx. Will they be able to breathe? No. Suffocation. So please make sure you think over these things. These things look so simple, but they are not simple. They, after effect, can be dangerous. Brain damage or death. It may occur within three to four minutes. So that's why the greatest risk for children under one year is more than clients with chewing or swallowing difficulties. Those who can swallow are uh, who have chewing difficulties just because they can choke in in three to four minutes they can god forbid pass away clients with mobility disorders if they're not able to move they also clients with intellectual disability who who have a disability one of the weakness on one side right side left side both sides who are completely uh, in bed. Now, how we can prevent suffocation? The common causes is choking, drowning, somebody who is drowned, inhaling gas or smoke, strangulation, electric shock, chewing and swallowing difficulties. If we prevent these things, we prevent suffocation. Carbon monoxide poisoning. 
It is sometimes called as the silent killer, colorless, odorless, tasteless gas, laughing gas. Uh, so this source is commonly a household appliance, fireplace, car. You, cars have that carbon monoxide, too much smoke. Person inhaling carbon monoxide will have no idea what is happening to him. If the garage is nearby your home uh, and it's closed and you start your car, your car is providing too much uh, carbon monoxide and a kid, an elderly is there while you're trying to start your car and warm it up. If too much uh, carbon monoxide comes by the time you things you open up your garage you get things in your client the elderly person or the child he or she can pass out can die just because of that carbon monoxide wait so that can cause death yes you turn on your car and you leave it on to go get things no if if ever this because we breathe in oxygen we don't breathe we breathe out carbon monoxide if ever Think of these scenarios. Did you, uh, I think a couple of years ago, it happened in Surrey that there was an accident when the garage was closed and there was they were starting a car. They didn't realize that there was too much carbon monoxide smoke. Carbon monoxide is smoke, black smoke coming out. And the family was standing. If it's a younger one and it's a, Elderly one, they are already, their airway, airway is already compromised. This, they cannot breathe in too much ox, oxygen. Their breathing is compromised all the time. They, they don't breathe uh, enough like us. Their lungs are not open, wide open like us. Already if it's not open and they breathe in carbon monoxide, will, will their lungs work properly? Will they get enough oxygen? No, it might be they it will be like a poisoning. We are thinking in terms of poisoning, not regular. If I put you in front, think of it. If we put you in front of a place where there's, uh, it's a place where uh, carbon monoxide is produced and it's a fuel area and there's somehow a leakage in the fuel. And there's a leakage of too much carbon monoxide and we are breathing it in. Yes, definitely it can cause death. And early symptoms of carbon monoxide problem is headache, nausea, and fatigue. Prolonged exposure can cause brain damage or death. It's If it's for a long, long time, yes. Or if it's every day somebody is working in... Uh, a factory where they produce these things and every day he's getting slowly and slowly slowly and slowly exposed to this it could cause accumulation of that carbon monoxide in their body and can cause death carbon monoxide detectors strongly recommended at home especially in areas where family members spend most of their time Follow manufacturer's instructions to ensure the device is working properly because some of the why it's saying strongly recommend at home, some of the heaters, water tanks, or what you say is your um, heating system works on not only on water, hydraulic, they work on these things. So if there's a leakage, it can again gas. It can cause. Replace batteries routinely and CO detectors can save lives. Restraints and how to avoid using them. A restraint is a device or a garment, barrier, furniture, medication that limits or restricts. Do you want to take a break or do you want to continue? I'm not pretty sure how many slides we have. We have quite enough slides. So do you want to take a break for now? And come back, we'll do the rest. We'll start from rest, or we are good enough to keep going. How many slides are there? There are, uh, I think, more than uh, 48 slides. 
we still have a long way to go. Mm. And let's take a quick break. How, what do you say? Guys? Nice. Okay? Let's not go home, uh, shut it down early. Let's take a break and then we'll do it. Because it's getting more overwhelmed, I think. I'm good, but I'm just thinking of you guys i was taking uh thinking of amrit so that he will not miss it that i was keep going but then i feel like you guys your facial expressions look so how long are you uh, is your wait time amrit uh, you're muted buddy hmm you're on mute. Is he on the phone? You can hear us. You're on mute. We don't know what you're saying. Yeah, I'm at, like got delayed. How long uh, is it? Uh, I'm gonna be like boarding around eleven thirty now. Eleven thirty. Earlier was used to supposed to be at ten thirty. But... Okay. So let's let's uh, continue till. You guys, you guys can carry on. I have all. I just told you I was yes, back I know, for today. So I know. It's okay. No worries. What we will do is just quickly we will take it till 11.30 we'll study and then at 11.30 we'll take it. So that at least we have uh, this idea of restraints. Let's see. Now, restraint is anything that blocks. If your client think of this, you want to block oh, he's getting up we always put, we get the table, we put it in front of the client, making it difficult for him to come up. This is restraint. All side, four side rails up on the bed is a restraint. A client, if you use tight clothes, is a restraint. When we give medications for them so that they can sleep, they fall asleep is a chemical restraint. It's called chemical restraint. When we put mittens, it's a restraint. When we put soft um, restraints, it's like a flap, and that flap is attached to the bed so that they don't move their arms, they still, or their legs, it's a restraint. A lap belt, safety belt, legs and arms closed with that spinel uh, metal pins is a restraint. So these are all restraints. But remember, all the time, except having a furniture in front of the bed, you don't need an order. Other than that, anytime you Restrain your client, you need to have an order. Stating what do you mean? When I want to restrict my client's movement, I can do it by putting a table in front of him on his bed. But if ever I am using a medication, I'm using a soft restraint, I'm using a mitten, I'm using all side rails up, a uh, lab belt, penel belts, I need to have an order from the doctor. If ever this is done, all these things are done without an order, a client can sue you for millions. So whenever you are putting someone on a restraint, make sure the doctor has signed it first. If ever we are at a risk and there's some, we can do anything, we do put them, there are scenarios when they don't have it, we do put them in the restraint, but at the same time, the nurse will follow up with the doctor right away, get the order in and keep it in the file. Okay. Every effort is made to protect clients without restoring to use of restraint. And another thing, 
one more important thing. When you put your clients on restraints, make sure the family is aware. If suddenly the family comes in and they see they're not happy. When they call in for an update, when they call in for an update, you can always update them. Hey, yeah, uh, everything is fine other than that. Uh, he was just trying to climb out of the bed. For safety reason, we just have him in a restraint fund. We have already informed you over the phone when you ask for an update. And then when they come in, it's not a shock. Seeing your loved one tied up, think of it. And you're not being informed. Some people, they will tell you, oh, if he's not, uh, if he's not um, cognitive, he doesn't sleep, you can always give me a call at night. I can come in. He might be confused. He might be looking for us. Yes, that's true. Every effort is made to protect clients without restoring uh, to the use of restraint. Restraints can cause emotional harm and serious physical injuries. When you are putting a restraint, a soft um, restraint, a mitten, a belt, uh, any of these things, make sure they're not so tight that their skin is break down. Another thing, if you are giving a chemical restraint that is a medication, do not give that much that they are so bloody drowsy that they can get up. So everything should be done properly. Right amount and right frequency. Right time. You can give things more or less. If you give them medication, but you underdose them, again, underdosing, giving less will not make any sense. It will not help. Giving overdose more can also come, cause harm. So giving something that you are doing in an appropriate frequency will help. If you give medication that is properly dosed, it will, it can help. If you put the restraint on and it's so tight, it causes bruising and it causes skin breakdown. What's the purpose? Emotionally also he's hurt and physically he's also hurt. So always make sure when you are putting a restraint, especially it is a soft restraint, it's a lab belt, it is a pinel belt, we always... Uh, it's standard to have two fingers uh, difference between the skin and the, our two fingers should be able to sneak in. We should be able to sneak our two fingers in. That's how much st space standardly we have to leave, lose. If the patient is already having issues with the medication that it is calling, causing swelling and then you tie the patient up, it will cause more swelling. You have to make sure that you balance things properly. Yes, my client should not be at a risk of fall, should not hit, but at the same time, I have to make sure that if I'm putting a restraint, I have to elevate the legs. I have to offload the legs with some pillows so that he or she is not at a risk of more edema. Swelling, the other name for swelling is edema. Okay. Support workers, oh no, here. Uh, restraints require a physician's order and are rarely used. Support workers never decide if restraints are to be used. You should never decide, should we do this? It is the nurse's call. Can you put a soft restraint on him? If you think he's getting out, he's unsafe, you can always ask, hey, nurse, hi, can we restrain the uh, client? Can you help? So she will help. She will look whether there's an order for them. Restraints and how restraints and how to avoid using them. Legal issues. Threatening a client with applying a restraint is considered to be an assault. 
You can tell them, hey, you know what? No. You don't threaten anyone. That is considered to be an assault. Using a restraint on a client without doctor's order is, a, is considered to be a battery. If you apply a restraint on a client and you don't have doctor's order, you are considered to be a battery. And there is, again, there are criminal charges uh, against how an assault is done, what the assault looks like, what a battery looks like, and what are the criminal charges that you will be charged for. Unnecessary restraint is considered false imprisonment. If you put on uh, restraints for someone, you should not. It can You can be at a risk of false imprisonment. You might be behind bars. Why did you uh, unnecessarily uh, trouble this guy? Not only emotionally, but physically as well. So you can be at a risk of false imprisonment. That's why I said things can go wrong. Always make sure when you provide safety, when you're providing care, make sure things are done in a right way, right position, right order, right frequency. You put a client on a safety belt, you put a client on a lab belt, make sure he or she has been changed. Make sure he or she is not wet. Make sure he or she does not have pain. You give pain medications. He or she is not lying so bad that uh, when they are breathing, when they have the saliva, it goes through their, it, somehow some uh, little bit goes through their airway and they are at a risk of aspiration. Always, when you put them in a restraint, keep their head up, offload their uh, feet. This is going to help. Restraints and how to avoid using them. Never you uh, these are used. Uh, restraints are never used to no. They're not used to discipline. Discipline means not in a way say uh, sit properly, uh, turn on the right, right side, sleep on uh, left side. Do not move your arm. Keep your arm still. We don't use restraints for that. They're never used for staff convenience. We don't use it for our convenience. That's true. It requires informed consent. Before you put a restraint on a person, he or she should authorize you. You should have a consent uh, in your file so that you can apply a restraint on your client. You cannot restrain your client right away. If ever your client, you have people who are kind of climbing out of the bed, they're not uh, cognitive. They're wondering what you do. You can bring them, make them sit on a jerry chair, sit them near the nursing station where we can keep an eye on them and make sure what's going on with them. Always make sure first we do measures that can prevent, which we can do. Then we give something for sleep. If that doesn't work, then the last would be soft restraints or uh, these restraints that we put lab belt and put up. Because these, they are very, very emotionally and it's also uh, not only emotionally, but also that it is the safety for the client in terms of their skin. If you put a restraint on, you always have to go and check the restraint policy because you cannot put restraint on for more than an hour. You always have to open and then put it back. The skin breakdown policy. Because when you put uh, someone in restraint, will he be able to move? No. So you go reposition the client, uh, reposition the restraint, check on the restraint. If after one hour, it's not sinosed, the patient might be pulling on the restraint. It became so tight that there's no circulation. So every... For circulation, I think it's every Q15 to Q30. Yes, Q15 to Q30, that's every 15 to 30 minutes. And for repositioning uh, in a restraint every one hour. Am I clear? You have to follow the 
policy before you apply this. If you are uh, giving a chemical restraint, you have given a medication, you have to go back and reassess the client uh, in 15 to 30 minutes. Whether the medication is having a good effect, uh, whether the medication worked, it might not work. You might have to give some more, depend on what the order looks like. Restraint safety guidelines. Restraints are only used for a short time as possible. We don't keep it for years and years and years. No, it's only if they are pulling, they have a foley in and they are trying to pull it. We are unable to redire redirect that patient. The patient is not settled. We are trying to settle him down, but it's unable. We, we are unable to settle the patient down. That time we use restraints. Patient has IV and he or she is trying to pull an IV out. And this, we can get the IV. It's, he's a hard start. So that's when the time comes in and we try to restrain our clients. Apply restraints with enough help to protect the skin and staff from injury. When you're applying a restraint or someone, you cannot do it alone. Reason one, they can, your client can be combative. Uh, second, your client, no matter what it is, you can do one side only. So your second client, second side is again, open. You can do it. Things they won't allow you. It will be difficult. Third, it's heavy and it's uh, back. It's not good for health. It's not good for your back. So you always ask for help. Yeah. The least effective method is used and manufactured in, uh, instructions are followed. Observe the client's Every 15 minutes or more often, I told you, uh, normally it's Q15 to Q30 or as per the care plan. Depends on what the care plan says. Require or release the restraint, reposition the client and meet the basic needs of two hours. What you do, you open it. You, basically, I have told you on mandatory basis, reposition every two hours, reposition him, then again, put it back. Follow the care plan. If ever somebody is um, that they get uh, abusive after putting a restraint, we don't do it for two hours. We might do it as per the care plan says. Okay. Otherwise, we have to have to do it every two hours and check on restraint every fifteen minutes. Let's take a quick break. Let's get back at twelve o'clock, and then we'll the rest okay we'll be back at 12 okay <clears throat> you see well
Okay, welcome. Everyone back? Yes. Awesome. Can you see the screen? Yeah. We... Okay. So now we were talking about a restraint, restraint safety guidelines. So what we do is we report and we record the following. What? So when we have a restraint on, on someone, we do have a restraint sheet. On that we go, we write the type of restraint that we have applied. Pinel restraint. Pinel means five point restraint, body restraint, hands restraint, legs restraint. And they're done with its uh, proper cloth, heavy duty material. It has strings like this, the hole, and then metal rods are placed inside it. So that's Pinel. When we talk about um, the other restraints, we'll have to write the name of the restraint, whether soft restraint, mitten restraint, chemical restraint, we put it like that. We put the type of restraint, we put the reason whether patient is aggressive, patient is abusive, aggressive, wanderer, uh, elopement risk, we put elopement risk has uh, one type tried to sneak out, or it is just a climber, restless. Safety measures are taken, the time at which you apply the restraint, the time at which you remove, and the time you release. So we do put uh, time of restraint on, time of restraint off, and then whenever in between Q, we, there is there are columns, we just say Q, five, hour, five minutes, Q, 10 minutes, that it has been removed every five minutes, 10 minutes. It depends on like, how it is. We don't do it every five minutes. We do 15 minutes restraint check. We don't loosen it, but we do check. And then we reopen it in an hour. So that's how we do it. When somebody is on restraint, chemical restraint or uh, these uh, restraints, we make sure we do a vital check. We do neurovitals. We do Q4H. Uh, just because we want to know whether when we have put someone on restraint, and the circulation is good, he or she is cognitively doing well. So for checking vitals, we never need an order. We don't need how often it should be checked. But somebody who is on restraint, there's a restraint policy that we have to follow. Depends one hour, every 30 minutes, how it would be. The care plan given uh, when the restraint was removed. And you also have to write when the last care was given. Last care was given means when the brief was changed, when the patient was sitting up in the upright position, you have to have to make sure that all those things yeah. have been notified and have been documented. Yeah. But Harsha and Saidi is, Dadi is quiet. You be quiet. Now, record and report. The following, what do we report and what do we record? do as a record? Skin color and condition. I told you, you have to make sure you look at the CWMS, color, warmth, moment, and sensation. When you put someone on a restraint, you do also have to check whether the color of the skin looks yellow, whether the color of the skin is blue, green, because it can be when we put these restraints, they are very, very tight. It can be, it is stopping the circulation. We have to also yeah. check whether the um, restraint that we put in the hands, normally it's on hands and legs or in the belly, it's warm to touch. It's not that cold. Uh, uh, look at the, if there's any scratch, abrasion from it. You have to check that thing. And you also have to ask uh, the client to do like this. I, then you press their uh, fingers and you ask them, can you feel when I'm pressing? Yes, they will remove their hand. That means that there is a uh, sensation in it. We are not blocking the mm -hmm. sensation just because we put the restraint from a long time, which can cause all these things. Condition of the limbs, you have to check. Limbs means upper limbs are uh, arms, lower limbs are called legs. So you have to check both upper limbs and lower limbs. Uh, sometimes you might, when you have to apply these um, restraints you might have to put um, gauze underneath so that it doesn't 
put marks, it doesn't leave marks on your clients. Uh, the pulse felt in the restraint part, when you put a restraint in the arms, make sure that you check there is a uh, there's a pulse, you check for that pulse change in the client's behavior. Is he get is he getting settled down after putting a restraint or is he getting worse? I told you restraint does not only this is what we are saying is physical restraints. There can be chemical restraints as well, medication. So make sure you check with the client's behavior whether this is uh, making the client settle down or is it accelerating the pro problem is this getting aggravated the patient's problem the patient is now he was not yelling now he started yelling help 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 so it really is not helping ah. because if your client starts to scream it is that others are at a risk as well they get this distracted any complaint of discomfort reported at once if they uh, if the client tells you it's very tight i'm uh, having difficult time breathing i do have numbness i have pain or this tingling in my restraint part you do have to uh, report those things and please make sure that uh, you discontinue it for a while that time now Phys types of uh, restraints, as I told you, this is called a physical restraint that we were talking about. Physical restraints can be garments or devices to restrict uh, movement of the whole body or part of body. Again, uh, bed alarm, uh, seat, uh, bed alarm, chair alarm or wonder guard is also a physical restraint. Leather restraints are applied to the wrist and ankles. Wrist restraints are limp holders, limit arm movement. Limp restraints are not only used if your patients are restless. Limp restraints can also be, one single limp can also be used if somebody is on IV medication, wants to sleep, is still not able to sleep just because he or she moves. She gives you a consent. You can put my arm. So do not put it as a restraint restraint. Put it loose. It's only to avoid uh, movement of the body through the night for the medication to go in. Hands are placed in mid restraints. I told you mid and restraints, mid restraints earlier. You put the hands, this is also uh, considered to be a restraint. They uh, prevent the finger use. If somebody is a digger, is digging in the pants and they keep on digging into other things in their glossary bag, poly bags, so, uh, uh, catheters, suprapubic catheters, we put mid so this is again a restraint. Bed restraints, bed alarms, they're applied at the waist when the client is in a chair. It's called as the other name for this lap belt, bed alarm, bed restraint, not bed alarm, bed restraint is uh, safety belt. So the type of restraints, environmental restraints, that is you bring in table, you put it in front of the uh, client's bed, you restrain the client from being moving from one place. You put the bed in a locked position where he cannot or she cannot move. Uh, you put side rails on. So all these are considered to be environmental restraints. When you are filling in the document sheet, you have to mention what kind of uh, restraint you have been using and the time when you started. Near the body, okay. It confines the clients to a specific place. Geodratic chairs are chairs with attached trays. Yes, I told you, we use those geodratic trays and chairs. Uh, we might also move them to the nursing station that we can keep an eye, continuous eye on them. Bed rails, locked rooms, and seclusion areas. Sometimes we have to put the clients in a single room and we close the door because after putting the restraint, the client keeps on yelling and we uh, we have tried our best to give him medications and everything, but doesn't work. So the last resort that was left with us is locking the room for the client. What we do, we put the client in the restraint, five point restraint, we lock the room, room we just leave a small space and then we meanwhile, Keep on going and checking on client whether he or she is breathing. Chemical restraint means medications used only to control behavior or movement. It must be 
used for discipline or for must not be used for discipline or for soft communities. Please make sure that you do not give it just because you like it and you don't uh, want that. You heard this patient is delirious and you will give it. No, it should not be. It can. It should only be used if the patient is aggressive. If the patient is really restless, climbing out, has behavioral issues, or agitated. Otherwise, we should not be using chemical restraints. Types of restraints: bed rails. All four bed rails up is a chemical restraint. Again, only one side restraint should be on. Supervisors or care plan directs when to raise the bed rails. If the client is shh, be quiet. If the client is confused, unconscious, sedated, or has a personal wish, you may put the side rail up. Otherwise, you don't put all side rails up. Bed rails can be a safety hazard. Client feels trapped and tries to climb over them. And when they try to climb over them, they will have a massive fall then if they fall from the bed. The need for bed rails must be noted in client's chart and care plan. If there's a need to put all the side rails up, the nurse should put the, or you should request your nurse to put that request in the care plan. Check the client's frequency when it's and how often the side rail should be raised. One side rail must be left uh, raised for always uh, one should be left uh, uh, for your assistance. Sometimes we do put side rails up at night because these beds that they sleep in are very small beds. And when they roll themselves into the bed, they don't realize uh, we are in the short bed they fall down. So on their request and being aware, we put all four side rails up. Okay. Creating a safe workplace. What do we have to look at? Occupational health and safety. Legislation is designed to protect employees from injuries, accidents in the workplace. So OHNS helps us. They designed a protect employee uh, injury incident plan that we should use. Every nursing station has an eye wash. Every nursing station has a cream. Every nursing station has um, sanitizers. Every nursing station has soap. We should always use things that are needed at the right time. Your employer and supervisor must take every reasonable precaution to protect your health and safety. Uh, we should, it's winter time, we should have enough gowns. Everybody should be masking. Everybody should be uh, vaccinated for COVID for vac uh, and for flu shot. All your sh uh, vaccines should be updated. That is what occupational health and safety looks at. Our occupational uh, health and safety looks at our vaccines. If we are due with vaccines, we should be uh, updated. If you get, uh, for instance, you were helping someone and you got a prick at the hospital, you need to get your tetanus shot. You should have it done before or at the right time you will get it. Create a safe, okay. A safe workplace. Employer's responsibility. What is your employer's responsibility? Have written policy that promotes safety. It should be written everywhere. It should be on a nursing station. It should be a copy of sh this should be given to you as well at the time of orientation. Reminders should be given to everybody if ever. Never ever uh, move in your hallway with the gloves on. The biggest Biggest mistake ever in your life would be you moving in with even a clean gloves. You only put gloves when you get in and you take it out when you get out. You do not walk in a hallway with a clean gloves on. I might touch it. I might touch is not the thing. We only put when we touch things. We do not unnecessarily move uh, with gloves on. We have seen uh, some of the I don't see only support workers. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of workers, uh, housekeeping, nurses, other 
to start uh, using it, it has always, always uh, lead to reports and they have been reported. So we do not put clean or dirty gloves in the hallway. <laughs> when we are in the train and educate employees about the policies. This is one of the policies, not from your workplace. This is Canadian health policy. You do not wear a clean or a dirty glove in hallway, unless you assist someone. Mommy. Create a health and safety committee to identify hazards and Mommy. investigate accidents. When, when accidents are happening, you always have to create, you should be a part of the team. How this thing happened, what should be done. If there's a fall, things happen, what should be done. It's called PSLS, patient care. Uh, it's for patient care, um, legislative, legislative safety issue, PSLS. You always do that. What should be done to prevent the fall or to prevent the incidents, any incident, and what would have went wrong. So there are two columns in it. One is what went wrong, what went wrong at that time. And the second column is what should we do to promote this thing from happening. We should not, we should put that uh, patient in the front area. There is less light on that side. The call bell, uh, should be checked. The call bell should be checked. All those things that what went wrong in that scenario should be reported. And it is it doesn't go against yeah. anybody. It is just to prevent yeah. things from happening for next time. Yeah. Yeah. Warn workers about yeah. safety hazards. If there's a spill, do not walk. If it's a uh, wet floor, Please make sure that you put that sign, wet sign on. So those things should be reported. Those things should be used. If they are not done, we do it. Uh, all those things. Report the incident, how it happened. Uh, it can also be somebody hit it, got hit. Not all the time it can be fall. Have all necessary equipments available. Somebody uh, choked, as I mentioned to you, during feeding. Uh, a patient has dysphagia, is having difficulty time swallowing, so had an incident. Incident can be anything. Everything should be reported. Employee responsibilities follow up. Daddy, please, I'm teaching. Leave him on his mercy. Employee responsibilities will follow all safety policies and procedures. Use recommended protective equipments, your PPEs, please. Report all safety hazards and concerns. If you see uh, there are issues, if there is no or uh, not enough sanitizers, uh, there, if you see there is, uh, there are some mats that should not be there, or you need some mats, there are not some signs present on there. So whatever concerns according to the place you work in, you should always report them. Even if they don't get changed, if tomorrow things happen, it's good that you have reported you will not be a part of that incident. Complete an incident or occurrence report. It's called incidents report. Every time any uh, incident happens, you have to report whether for good, for bad, whether you being a part or not being a part of it. Sometimes we have uh, incident reports that are unwitnessed and sometimes it's witnessed. No, Stating no, the fall, a person you went into the room and you saw the patient on the floor. You don't know how it happened. You don't know what it uh, uh, what happened, but you still have to report. You still have to do an incident report. What you write on it is an unwitnessed fall. During the unwitnessed fall, you write patient found on floor, whether he's in an upright position on his face, on a side, breathing, uh, if there's blood, if there's any wound. So it depends on how you find the person on the floor or how, what the incident looks like. Um, so all side rails up, you will look in your environment, what it looks like and how it is. Then you ask the client what happened and you report that. As per the client, blah, 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 these things happen. So this is what we have to, how we do an incident report. And you write what time you found him on the floor. That's very, very mandatory that 
you report one what time you found the person in the pool. Refuse unsafe work. If you feel this is unsafe work, mm -hmm. it's too heavy, two people at one place, you might know. As long as your refusal does not endanger your client. Or it's not that every time you refuse, all the works. OHNS requires healthcare employees to understand the risk hazards of substance Babies and how in the bed on them. And phone pet car call. Uh, handle them safely. Sometimes what? the good example will be if your client is on radiations, if your client is on a chemotherapy and you are dealing with the client, you have to make sure that if you are yourself immunocompromised, you might you might refuse. Your employee employer has to understand what you're coming from. Okay. Exposure occurs under normal working conditions. Bye bye. You, you might, you bye might, bye. you might be exposed to things only when you are working. Examples of hazardous materials can be drugs used in cancer therapy, that I told you, gases that are used to sterilize equipment. You don't if you work, and you have to sanitize something. And you have to use any gas on it or any liquid on it. That time you might be um, exposed to that. Oxygen. Sometimes we do oxygen therapy. Or um, we use CPAP machines, BiPAP machines on them. And there's some oxygen coming out. Putting a patient in a room with negative pressure. That one. Disinfectants and cleaning solutions. Some people are allergy have allergies to uh, what is it called hand sanitizers. Some people have allergies to latex, so you have to use latex free <laughs> latex free gloves. So those things you decide for yourself. Wins. Guys, uh -huh. bad. Wimps, Wimps, you have to have to do it on your. Again, I'm repeating. You cannot go on your practicum without doing Wimps on your learning hub. Wimps is workplace hazardous material information system. It tells you when and what to do. Stop moving. Three components of Wimps is one, how to label. Second. Material safety data sheets that tell you what the material is and where to place it. And third one, worker education and training programs. If things happen, what do you do? Label, uh, WIMS label provides information for safe handling. S supplier uh, applies label or the employer, employer, he applies it on the product. Telling you about the product information, what the product is. It tells you who the provider is, where we got it from. It, it should have a hazard symbol on it. It tells you the risk, it should tell the risk factors if it will happen and who should not be touching it. Precautionary statement, if things, if accidentally got touched or spilled, what should be used as a first aid? Because not all of them are same. It can not all can cause same burns. Not not all can cause same uh, degree of harm. <laughs> Warning labels identify physical and health hazards. What can be the physical and health hazard? If you if you open a bo um, bottle cover accidentally, you smoke it and you inhale it. What could happen? Precautionary measures. It should be there. Should be a precaution sign. What personal, if ever, you need. Let's say you need this. Um, what is it called? Bleach. And this bleach is not a regular bleach. It is the bleach that we use, not the regular cloth bleach. It's stronger. So, it should tell you to use a mask. Which mask to use? Um. 
it should not be a regular gown it has to be a different gown it has to be your rubber shoes long rubber shoes should be on so it tells you what it what protective you have to wear a goggles when you're dealing with it so it tell it should tell you what pro protective equipment to use Sadi, close it now because your brother is making noise how to use the substance safely and where to store it and how to dispose it when you use you cannot put it in regular one how to dispose it do mc don minton later if an if a warning label is removed or damaged do not use the substance because you don't know what it is and you don't know what harm it can cause no there should not Take the container to the nurse and explain the problem. Do not leave the container unattended, please. Because if there's no not a proper Daddy. label, if there's not a proper label, label on it, somebody might touch and get burns. Safety material data sheets. Every every time we check, we put that. Um, on a sheet yes label when has been moved when has been placed because sometimes what happen is if they are in a container and those containers are like uh, the for uh, the ones that we have food con uh, food in it it might get um, rusted and it might start leaking so you have to put the you always have to make sure it's not rusted you have to put the this product name on it what it is in i don't know be quiet i told you so many times employees must have the access to md msds uh, msds is a sheet that we use on online user has uh, check the mds before you have to check the uh, substance check the leak or spill and check the substance that where it needs to be disposed. Tell the supervisor about the leak or spill right away. No. Do not leave a leak or spill unattended. Always make sure you put the signs, leak signs. Do not put wet because it's not only wet. You have to put hazardous sign there. It's a black color, not the yellow one. You put sign board. Your employer provides hazardous substance training or uh, uh, somebody who's going on in that side should be wearing rubber boots long rubber boots you don't use the regular ones reducing personal security risk workplace violence is any physical assault or threatening behavior that occurs in work settings include physical trauma robbery rape kidnapping Beating, stabbing, shooting, and murder. This happens all the time when you work in uh, hospitals. And when this thing happens, we do a lockdown. The doors are closed. Those who are inside are inside. Those who are outside are outside. Only working people, uh, care aid, uh, housekeeping, nurses, doctors can move in with permission. There is security because we, we don't know we don't know if ever the person who caused this harm is there or has left or has a gang so we the, for that reason we have to put per people in lockdown we close all the doors ex all exits are closed insiders are inside outsiders are outside unless somebody needs to get in comes with security workplace violence can occur in any place where an employee performs work-related duty. It can be permanent or temporary place of work. If you are working in a psych ward, you will see these things very common. Workplace violence, home care workers, RNs, PNs, practical Gee. nurses, PN means uh, practical nursing, support workers, that's you, have personal security risks, because you don't know what's happening at home. It might be that per person is uh, aggressive today. They work alone in an unknown, uncontrolled environment and often work early or late hours. 
that's why if you work in late hours for a night shift for home care where you go to people's house you are never going there alone though the nurse supervisor uh, goes with you they do not provide care but they stay there for your safety okay clients family members could act violently either your client or their families can be violent can be aggressive that's the last slide we have any questions still now hmm? anything that comes to your mind when it comes to safety or what you need to know what you have to do Hmm? Hmm. Huh? So what we would do is I will look into an assignment because you are three and I don't know about the rest three we'll, we'll deal with that we will not bring that group in this one just because uh, you guys are a bit ahead of them and they are uh, not able to do this. I will give you all an assignment. I will speak of an assignment today whether we will do it an aggressive one or what. And I will let you know tomorrow so that we can work on that assignment. Will be your assignment you would do. It, it either will be an interviewing with a client or it would be dealing with an aggressive client. And it should not be copied from uh, a computer. You should be going and helping. Like you should look for a client. Um, it can be anywhere. You know your community, your fam, like around in uh, someone you know from the family. It can be. I will give you all the details. I will give you what to look for in that client. Every section would have um, um marks i will give you the format of it how what how do you feel like you need to find a client like it could be it can be family member it can be someone you know it can be your someone from the fam mm -hmm. like friends or someone in your community okay okay <clears throat> unless works. unless it's not a real client how would you come to know what to do? You won't get an exposure before you start, mm -hmm. oh. right? You're mm -hmm. not. You don't. You don't go there and help him. But at least you can watch, look into it. Yeah, that's true. And if it's if there will be a difficult time, then you are going for a practicum. How would you be able to deal with all those things? Hi. So I would create a today. I will create Hi. a scenario. Um, Hi. that for, a format of how things should look like, and based on that, we'll go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions regarding safety? Um. Everything was clear. Yeah. If I go fast, if I. If at any point you feel like I need to change some, I need to tell slowly, I need to repeat, please feel free to let me know. Okay. This, is your, this is your learning time. If ever you think I should repeat at some time, it's not clear, you can always let me know. Do not hesitate. We, are, we have this time to learn. We can only learn when we can when we make mistakes. If you don't mistakes, if you don't ask, you might not be able to. Okay. I have yeah, a question. Uh, like uh, should I join them? The three of them, for the. You only missed one one or two chapters. I will be covering those with you. Oh, okay. They might start late. It's not a good option for you to do with go with that mm -hmm. i will i know you have some chapters that need to be covered i will uh, go over with those things might be if you have a weekend off or let's see what how it will work i will let you know 
don't worry about it. Mom, the fifty-four slide. Huh? You it said um you were talking about robbery and rape and kidnapping. Yes. So let's so for example, let's say we're working at the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And um somebody comes in with a gun and then we go on lockdown. Um, like how do you calm down your patients? Like what do you say to them? They don't they don't they don't they don't uh know it. It's just that we know we always uh, we yeah. have see how it is. If there's a client steady, stop please. If you have, if you have a client who was being shot, not all hospitals, not all hospitals have it. It is specifically a uh, trauma hospital. Do you understand something? I told you so many times nicely. A trauma hospital is either Royal Columbian or Surgery, Surrey Memorial. So those two hospitals, it will be brought down to these two all. We, we are informed ahead of times. The ECC, the patient care coordinator, is aware ahead of times that a trauma is coming. And the trauma is that the, there's a shooting that has happened in the uh, in Kukitlam or wherever it is, and it has they have been brought down. Once they are brought to us, we don't know that as soon as they are got in, we close our doors. The insiders are insiders, the outsiders are outsiders. If someone, if our client's family wants to go out, then we tell them, hey, we are in a, sorry, we are in a lockdown uh, right now due to some reason. We don't tell them why. So if, uh, if you don't mind, if you go out, you won't be able to no. Yeah. If you go out, you won't be able to get in. If you want to get in, then you will have to contact your primary nurse, your patient's primary nurse. She will accompany you. She will accompany you. So that is what she will accompany you. You will have to do that. Okay? That's what okay. we have. Second thing, if there's a case of God forbid rape, there are him. scenarios and they are brought uh, there to us. Somebody is amber alert, brought down. That time we lock down again, making sure we don't know whether the person who did it is pre already present there before us, before the client arrived, because everybody here knows. Oh, they might or uh, they might get that information. The client has been moved to Royal Columbia. Remember, I told you some people are do not acknowledge. Yeah. These are the people who are do not acknowledge. They do not put their names on the uh, computer list. When they don't have their names on, they cannot say whether they are there or not. What do you mean? If I'm looking, I'm a shooter. Okay. I have shot someone. And I want to know whether... He's in Royal Columbian Hospital or he's in Surrey Memorial. I go there. I will tell you. Um, I just want to know where Mr. Smith is. They will tell me, what's your name? Are you an extra kin? Because it's it's a case of uh, hit, right? Ro either a case of robbery, either a case of rape, either a case of shooting. They'll, uh, they will check on the file. Ambrin is not there. They will tell us, uh what they do not tell you because you're telling them the name uh, it's uh, mr smith do you who are you who mr smith i don't have much information he's already on c c c name a blah blah or do not acknowledge or they will be on the screen there's always a computer screen where clients can see where the person is in which bed for say for their own to go in. That on that screen, we do not put their names. We will put a bed, and in that bed, we will put a dash. They don't know what the dash is. Is it mm -hmm. empty? Is it full? For us, we know the dash stands for occupied. Mm -hmm. This is do not acknowledge. Oh. Okay. Even sometimes the clients are do not acknowledge oh. for their mothers because they get abused from the mother, father, and Family, husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And why? When they don't know which bed they are in, what floor they are in, they know they are in the hospital. How, where, which bed they can enter? Yeah, but sometimes they go to like each room. And, like they you cannot them. enter in everybody's room. If you see, if you see a, a person, because you are the nurse who will be there, or you are the support worker who no. works 12 ah, hours or 8 no. hours. No. If you see someone getting in one person's room, can you stop? Yeah. Sadi, stop it! I told you so many times. I if did. you see someone getting into somebody's room and just came out and he's looking for another room, as my responsibility, as your responsibility, we ask you, what are you trying to do? What are you looking for? You don't mm -hmm. allow person to get into everybody's room for confidentiality mm -hmm. i might have to call security if you're trying to get into the room you will have to let me know who are you looking for how can i help you why don't you check on the reception and look where the client is Dang. because we are the Dang. ones who are working we are not working for one minute or two minutes. We are working for a shift. And if we see this person coming again, we are working, we, we can report it. And someone who will come and look for, that person is already, we know that, oh, there is a client on this floor who is DNA, who is do, do not acknowledge DNA. And um, somebody might be looking for it. We have to be alert more. So if someone comes in and tries to look into where it is, we know there's something wrong on our floor already. Yeah. Right? So that is when we have to use our third sense, third eye. Okay? Okay. Any other question? No. No? Always make sure uh, if somebody is, um, another thing, if someone, he or she has been raped or things go wrong, we do not, unless, unless the team, uh, it's not the regular team from the hospital, they are called coroners, unless, they don't, unless the coroners do not come and check them, identify it as a rape, do not give them things to change. In your job, normal, everyday job is if someone if someone comes to your workplace, uh, you you are working in a hospital. Your job is to give them a gown or the hospital clothes to change in. But if you see on the file on a sheet that it says the person is having was kidnapped or raped. You do not give them clothes to change. It's a special team called coroners who come and check them because they check the way they are, the clothes they are wearing. They have to check the, uh, they have to apply some uh, chemicals on it to verify that this accusation of being uh, saying is being raped. We don't ask them to wipe and wash their perineal area. No. Okay. Then how will it, if there's any secretion, it's been washed, how will they come to know? Yeah. Once they check them, then we help them, we give them moral support, we stay with them, we provide them with touch and support. And if somebody is raped, do not touch. Because sometimes this touch can trigger their mind. With words, calm them down. A simple touch Love. can bring out issues do you understand what i mean someone who's been already raped by touch if you touch them without saying what will happen they will start right? Screaming. right so be very mindful of things that can create more trouble okay how is it good good yeah yeah good any other questions? Any other thing? No. I keep on giving scenarios instead of reading these slides because that's real life. We do reading can be done anytime, but if you don't have an 
idea of real life things happening you won't be able to kind of we will be we will we will um, not this unfortunately this whole week i am working i have i'm uh, i don't have enough time to be there but we'll start from next next week we, we will do the whole hopefully the week in the lab so that you do things you get familiar with things and you like doing things when you only read it sometimes is very scary and you, it scares you to the point. Okay. okay. So next week from Monday to Friday, Friday. We'll see how many days. We will make sure that everybody is getting acc uh, accommodated. Nobody has any trouble. Okay? okay. Have a wonderful day ahead. You Thank, you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Are you going to teach us tomorrow? Huh? Are you going to teach us tomorrow? Is it going to be Yes. I will be teaching you tomorrow. Okay. It was Thank only you. one day uh, Sal was teaching, but otherwise I will be teaching you guys. Okay? Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Bye. 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 <laughs> bye bye. Yes, bye bye. Okay. Bye bye is done. Thank bye you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bless bye you guys. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.